of the Veracruz City Council. If you would like to comment on a closed session item, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. In this part of the meeting, the council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the public line will be closed and inaccessible. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely. I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meeting. I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Mayor, um, Vice Mayor is logging in now. Councilmember Watkins. Not here. Calentari Johnson. Present. Brown. Here. Cummings. Here. Golder is currently absent. Um, Vice Mayor Bruner. Present. And Mayor Myers. Present. Great, thank you. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak to any items listed on the closed session agenda? Let me just look to see if we have any folks in the audience. I'm not seeing any attendees, uh, and I have not received any notice that anyone was planning to speak today or requested to. Um, I am not seeing any, then uh, we will go ahead and this meeting is now adjourned and council will go into its closed session. Okay, I'll go ahead and get started. If council members could turn on their cameras if they're available, that would be great. I know some people are still coming in. Good afternoon, welcome to our 1 p.m. session of the August 24th, 2021 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely. I wanna thank the public for staying home today to view today's city council meeting. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, please call in at the beginning of the item you are wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming. So if you continue to listen vision or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it is time for public comment, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have commented on your item of interest. And I would like to ask you to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Watkins. Present. Helen Tari Johnson. Present. Brown. Here. Cummings. Here. Boulder. Here. Vice Mayor Bruner. Good afternoon, present. And Mayor Myers. I am present. Thank you. Just a little bit. Okay, uh, we're gonna start off this afternoon with uh, a few presentations and um, and then we will, um, we have three presentations and then we'll, we have two mayoral proclamations. So I'll go ahead and invite up the executive director of the 418 project and she is here to discuss their new facility downtown. Laura, you should be able to come on in and Okay. Bonnie, has she checked in with you? Um, yeah, let me.
don't see her in the audience. She is. Is she here? She is. I, I promoted her to panel. There she is. There she is. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? We can hear you great. Yes. Hi. Thank you so much. It's nice to see your faces. And I know there are a lot of people, too, that I, I can't see. So um, let me just say, Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, and everyone who serves the city of Santa Cruz, hi. I'm Laura Bishop. I have the um, unique privilege to be the executive director of the 14 Project, and I want to share some updates. And I, in case you're wondering, no, this is not a green screen. This is the, um, the projection room in our new home, which is the um, Old Riverfront Theater, and it's the audio booth. It's my favorite room here. And so what's important about that is that uh, the 14 Project, which has been serving Santa Cruz for 28 years, we just invested $2 million in downtown. And so we just were able to purchase, uh, and this is actually owned by the nonprofit, so this is actually um, community-owned, uh, portable, accessible, 22,000-square-foot facility that is located one block from the mall between the Tannery and the Warriors right at the Dragon's Gate. And so I'm just excited to share some things about this that I want you guys to know about. Um, yeah, I, I, even though I'm not with you in the room, I'm I'm nervous, and it's just nice to be seeing you. Sonia, you were at our diversity event last Saturday, and that was super cool. Um, Mayor Meyer met with Congressman Jimmy Panetta um, last week to talk about green infrastructure um, support. And so what I want you guys to know is that um, we are so excited to be part of the reemergence of our fair city not only from COVID, but also um, I want to tell you a little bit about what we're up to and under the framework of health and all policies, because we really feel excited to be able to be um, supporting the city of Santa Cruz in, uh, and equity and public health. So I'm just going to kind of give you guys the high, the high spots on that. But what I want to tell you is um, we're here. We're going to be here for generations. We're community owned. And if you haven't come down and said hi, like, please come down and say hi. Um, yeah, we're just here. So essentially the, the high spots are that this is the old Riverfront Theater and we are not tearing it down. You know, we're repurposing this building. And so we're taking it from an outdated, antiquated, you know, passive kind of movie theater into all adaptive community space. And what that means is that um, we're going to have a variety of spaces that will be really um, – a place for arts businesses to grow, um, for for artists in Santa Cruz, this is whether you're just starting out or whether you're you're established or or not. There'll be affordable places for people to come and grow their businesses with us. Also, that um, just to give you guys a little bit of a perspective, prior to the pandemic and our founding location, and you know you guys might know this because you know us. We've been around for a long, long time. We were bringing a thousand people a week to downtown and serving about 450 artists a year. And so realistically, in the new facility, we're talking about being able to serve 2,000 artists and impact most likely over 50,000 people. And that means 150,000 visits to downtown. So not only coming to shop and dine and, and just partake in downtown Santa Cruz, but also now people that are coming for regional events. So that's the impact in terms of the, the user base. But there's something else that we, um, but there's more, <laughs> but there's more. So, so um, what I would also say about last week's meeting with, with uh, Congressman Panetta is that we were joined um, not only by Mayor Myers, but also by Greg Pepping of the Coastal Watersheds Council. And so what we're doing is we, we finally got it, we're committing. So not only are we committing to, um, a quite a substantial open air roof gathering space on our roof overlooking the river that will serve up to 100 people at a time. Because, you know, if we had an open air gathering space, we could be open right now. And who knows how long we're going to be riding the whole COVID thing, maybe the rest of our lives, I don't know. So we're, we're committing to providing a really um, substantial place for people to gather safely. But and we were also already talking about photovoltaic, but we've also just committed to going um, for a living roof. So if you can imagine 10,000 square feet of wildflowers on the roof, along with um, 
garden beds for people to learn, for children to learn about gardens and for a place for people to gather to just overlook the river. The other benefit of that is, is that this roof will help make us more than carbon neutral. It actually make us a carbon positive um, contributor, helping reduce pollution and cool the neighborhood off and, and helping really even bring the health of the river back. Like this is something that's, um, yeah, we hope, I mean, we hope that this will not only be something that's good for us, but also is a model for Santa Cruz. So let me get into, let me get a little bit more organized. I have, I have my notes in terms of sustainability, equity, and public health. So essentially in terms of sustainability, the, um, we're hoping that this project will really contribute to the city's uh, climate action plan. Um, we're really intending to have uh, 400 photovoltaic uh, panels. We're really learning about the scope of the, of the project, but we're really, um, yeah, we're really, really committing to using the latest in tech. So um, gonna be using green construction um, standards and techniques. So uh, of course, and this is um, a source of green jobs. Uh, as well as arts jobs. So this remodel will be um, immediately helping the economy. And in terms of equity, I mean, so something else that we really got, I mean, 418 has historically had a really widespread intergenerational community base, but we really get that um, our purpose and our people and our place and our processes and our power dynamics, they're really, it's not enough just to provide a space anymore. So we're really, our strategic plan already had in place that there was a, a gap in our service, uh, significantly with our Latinx neighbors, um, you know, Beach Flats and Live Oak. And so we're really doing more to create more equitable outcomes. So we, um, I'm really happy to, um, let you know that we were just honored by a grant from the Arts Council of our uh, racial equity work. And we were just also honored by a major grant from the California Arts Council as well, of general support. It's also in service of not only our community uh, programming, but our, also our equity work in that. And then finally, um, public health, really that, um, so there's so many ways to talk about it. I mean, obviously we're a movement art center. So our principles are community, art, embodiment, and mindfulness. And so we're a source of well-being, whether people come to do aerial arts or qigong or come to dance church or do an affordable performance. Um, that's what we are, that's our stock and trade, that's what we do. But also we're adjacent to the river. So in terms of supporting Santa Cruzans to walk, to see us or ride their bikes or take public transport, like that's what we've always done. We've always been on the river. We've always been kind of a scrappy um, community art space that we really get what it's like. We really get what it takes to, to be downtown. And so I'm just kind of geekily excited that we're here to stay. So um, I don't know. I mean, I feel like now's when I would ask you what do you guys want to know, but I, I know I only have a few minutes with you. So, um, yeah. And typically, Laura, we don't do a back and forth during presentation time, but I think maybe the main invitation is, I would assume, for council members who want to come see your facility. Um, I'm assuming you're you're an open door. So, um, really, really pleased to hear about all the things that you guys are doing, and really glad you could update. Thank you so much. Um, thank you guys. Um, we, we, um, we're here for you. We're here with you. And um, please, you know, this is a town where relationships are central. And I, I just want to invite you to be creative and, and let me know if you can think of relationships that might be of support of us to us right now. Um, of course, city funding, but also we're going to be launching our capital campaign. So I, I invite you and, and request if, it's, if you can think of any productive relationships um, please, please don't hesitate to let me know. I would be really grateful for that. Thank you so much, Laura, and thanks for making the time. Take care, you guys. Welcome to downtown. Well, welcome, welcome back to downtown. You never left, but no, we didn't. In no, we didn't. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Um, next, we have uh, Kaylin Foster Renda, co-executive director of Monarch Services. Welcome, Kaylin. Thank you, Hi, so much. 
Thank you for having me today. My name is Kellen Foster-Renda. I'm the co-executive director of Monarch Services. For those of you, I'm, I know most of you, and I know most of you know, but in case someone doesn't, we are a service provider of domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking, both intervention and prevention services. And we've provided those services with Santa Cruz County for the past 44 years. So the reason I am here today is because we have seen a dramatic increase in the number of domestic violence cases as well as the severity of the violence that we're seeing. Over the past year, we've seen a 250% increase in the number of support and crisis line calls. We've seen a 75% increase in the number of services Monarch is providing. We've seen a 150% increase in the number of and we sadly having, having to add another individual to the femicides in this community totaling five today. That is more than the cumulative 11 years I have worked at Monarch. So why? Why is this currently happening? Thank you, Bonnie. I'll go ahead and move on from the slides. <laughs> No problem at all. Um, so the impact of COVID we know has been extremely traumatic for many members of our community. For those that have experienced significant trauma in their lives, such as the collective trauma of racism or poverty, the traumatic impacts of COVID, such as getting ill or the fear of getting ill, losing loved ones, having to be an essential worker, the lack of childcare and or school resources, loss of jobs and salary, has created a cumulative trauma for many of our community members. Historically, when there is cumulative trauma or trauma after trauma, violence increases. Our clients are reporting that financial stressors, the lack of access to resources such as childcare and mental health services, isolation from family and coworkers, and being at home in crowded housing situations with little to no personal space have all dramatically exacerbated the violence within the relationships and homes. So what can we do as a community? In the short term, bystander intervention works. If you see or hear something, intervene. Call law enforcement, call Monarch. If it's safe to do so, physically or verbally intervene in that situation. Listen more and reach out to friends, family, and coworkers. If you notice something is different about somebody that you care for, don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to provide resources. If you're an employer, you can offer resources in disclosed locations such as restrooms so that people can access services. And use your social media platforms to be able to provide information around local resources such as Monarch Services, Walnut Avenue Women's Center. But what do we do in the long term? It's imperative that we improve the safety net services for people with historical trauma. It has got to be a long-term community investment. Investing in such things as safe housing and financial assistance such as universal basic income, job training, education, et cetera. At Monarch, our housing program, which offers financial assistance and case management to support survivors in securing safe and stable long-term housing, support services necessary to keep those families housed, such as financial assistance for education, childcare, transportation, physical and mental health services. We have seen over the past three years of this program that 96% of the clients that participate, participate in that program do not go back to violent relationships. Those fundamental entities work and prevent violence. We also need to increase the availability and access of mental health services. These services are severely lacking, and there has never been a more critical time when these services are needed. In closing, we're dealing with a pandemic within a pandemic, and it is an imperative that our community offers and provides the resources necessary to those hurting so much at this time. I really thank you for your time and your leadership, and I look forward to more conversation around this of what we can do as a community to end this violence. Thank you, Kaylin. Thank you very much for that uh, presentation. I'm really glad that you were able to come and speak with us, and please uh, reach out anytime there's program development or needs to, to uh, utilize the city council presentation period to keep people up to date. I mean, these are very, very serious numbers, and. 
Um, and unfortunately, I think we're, we're not gonna get out of COVID for a while. So making sure that we as policy makers really understand what's happening in our community is very, very helpful. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Take care. Take care, you too. Okay, next we have uh, the beach cleanup presentation and I'll invite up uh, Tony Elliott, our director of parks and Rachel Kaufman, our recreation superintendent. Welcome you guys. Thank you. Good afternoon, mayor and city council members. And uh, today it's the moment that you've all been waiting for, the results of the city council member beach cleanup challenge. And so joining me on the Zoom meeting are the recreation and park staff who assisted in the beach cleanup efforts along with WARP Supervisor Britt Hogberg, who had the monumental task of organizing the cleanup of Maine and Cowell beaches all summer long. Um, so I'm just, at this time, I'm gonna share my screen for our presentation. Great, hopefully you can see that. So uh, Beach Cleanup Challenge 2021, this is the Olympic edition. <laughs> so to recap, this summer, our Parks and Recreation Wharf staff were challenged as people flocked to our beaches and the boardwalk, and after having an awesome time at the beach, sadly left large amounts of trash on our beaches. Uh, Mayor Myers participated in a beach cleanup with Parks and Recreation Director Tony Elliott on May 24th. And after that event, she encouraged city council members to organize cleanups at the beach this summer. Our creative Parks and Recreation staff jumped on that idea and created the city council member beach cleanup challenge as part of the July Parks and Recreation Month activity. So the council member who brought out the most volunteers to help clean Maine and Cowell beaches would be awarded the Beach Cleanup Cup. So inspired by the Summer Olympics, the gold medal winner, we're calling it, will win the amazing first ever Beach Cleanup Cup <laughs> that was designed by Wharf Supervisor Britt Hoberg and the Wharf team. And so the beach cleanup cut, it's hard to see the amazingness in this photo, but you will soon see it uh, mm -hmm. in person, but it's made up of a piece of beach driftwood, the main beach, carefully stained by Wharf Supervisor Britt Hoberg with the golden trash can filled with symbolic trash, emphasizing the enormous effort put forth by the winning team. And the plaque reads, City Council Beach Cleanup Challenge Champion 2021. So as I mentioned, city council members were up for our challenge and scheduled a cleanup date along with a parks and recreation staff person for July and into August. And the volunteer beach cleanups really provided enormous help to our work crew. We had a total of 153 volunteers come out this summer to help clean Maine and Cowell Beach. And I also want to recognize the Parks and Recreation staff who helped organize the cleanups on the weekends, Recreation Supervisors Jesse Bond, Robert Acosta, D.C. Lawson Thomas, and Isaac Ray, London Nelson Auditorium Coordinator Jack Sproul, our Principal Management Analyst Lindsay Bass, and Park Superintendent Travis Beck were all assigned to help with your cleanup. And then of course, I, want, I also wanna acknowledge the heroic wharf staff who kept the beaches clean all summer long, each and every day. Patrick Mason, Simon Chan, Ryan Kane, and Lupe Silva. And so at this time, I uh, wanted to invite up Britt Hoper just to say a few words to just about the help that this uh, provided. So Britt, if you're there. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, I just wanna say thank you from staff and myself. Um, it, was, it was a very challenging year for us. Um, I just wanna thank you for all your hard work and my staff totally amazed at your support and uh, it means a lot to them. Thank you. Thanks, Brett, very much. 
Um, and now, the moment you've all been waiting for. I'm like such a nerd. I'm so excited about this. <laughs> and here is the beach cleanup cup. And um, this, the winner of the coveted inaugural beach cleanup cup, and I'll say, little shout out, only council member with decorated trash buckets is council member Justin Cummings with 37 volunteers. So congratulations, council member Cummings. Your award will be delivered to your office at City Hall that you can proudly display. Um, and so just really, in all seriousness, a huge thank you to each and every one of you for helping support and just also a huge thank you to the volunteers that came out this summer to help all of you. Um, we really thank you and appreciate your efforts. So kudos to all of you. Thank you. Um, thanks, uh, Tony and, and, and all your whole staff, Rachel, everybody. Um, it was great to um, have your staff was a huge support showing up on weekends and after work and everything else. So it was really, um, I know you guys spent a lot of time to get this, make this happen. And um, so, yeah, I really appreciate, um, you know, you guys putting this together. It was super fun. And uh, I think there's a lot of uh, new uh, beach cleanup fans that could be recruited. So, um, you know, I don't know how we make it happen. I know Save Our Shores does theirs, but certainly a lot of people are really interested in continuing to do the work. So. Um, thanks to all everyone that helped on your on your department because we couldn't couldn't have had this fun event without you. So thanks again, and thanks to all the council members for bringing people down and getting the beach cleaned up for sure. Well done. Thank you guys. Have a good day. Okay, next up we have uh, a mayor proclamation. A mayoral proclamation, and um, this is for uh, declaring October 1st, 2021, as Chris Schneider Day. And um, Chris, I'm excited to uh, read this for you. Whereas Chris Schneider, Assistant Director in City, the City of Santa Cruz Public Works Department, has announced his retirement. And whereas Chris Schneider began his career with the city on March 23rd, 1987, thereby contributing over 34 years of uninterrupted service to the people of Santa Cruz. And whereas Chris Schneider's light sense of humor, realistic approach and decades of experience have made him a respected leader and mentor to various staff in the city. And whereas Chris Schneider has been awarded an incalculable amount of awards throughout his career, and they will continue to adorn the administration and engineering office as a reminder of his legacy. And whereas Chris Schneider's project focused approach may have been viewed as inflexible, but it was a great asset in his delivery of bridge trails, roundabouts and intersection improvements, which improve the quality of life for everyone in Santa Cruz. And whereas Chris Schneider has been a project wizard, always able to find a way to do more with less to deliver projects more amazing than envisioned. And whereas Chris Schneider has led and contributed to so many critical projects in that one cannot pass a public works project that he has not touched. And whereas Chris Schneider has attended more ribbon cuttings than you can count, <laughs> represented the city at countless public uh, at countless public meetings and responded to thousands of community requests always, well, almost always with a smile. And whereas Chris Schneider has a love for chocolate, which helped him maintain when jumping between field studies, project meetings, budget meetings, interagency meetings, and council meetings. And whereas Chris Schneider's dedicated work will continue to be utilized and appreciated as people walk, bike, or drive over the 2,000 plus engineering projects completed during his career, such as segment 789, Beach Area Roundabouts, San Lorenzo River Trestle Bridge, Branch of Forty Creek Bridge, Multi-Use Trail, Murray, Murray Street Bridge, Highway 1 and 9 Expansion, Arana Gulch Multi-Use Path, West Cliff repairs, repairs, and countless paving, landfill, and sewer storm drain projects. And whereas Chris Schneider's last day of service to the city will be Friday, October 1st, 2021. Now, Ron Myers, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim October 1st, 2021, 
as Chris Schneider Day in the city of Santa Cruz and urge all his colleagues and fellow community members to join me in thanking him for his years of service, recognizing his exceptional leadership and substantial contributions to the Public Works Department and to the smooth operation and safety of our city and wishing him well on his retirement. Chris, um, just so thankful for everything you've done for our community and um, would love to, you know, if you have a few words and uh, Mark, I don't know if, if you have, but just want to open it up and again, just recognize everything you've done, Chris, it's been amazing. Um, yeah, thank you very much for recognizing me today. Um, it really has been um, a wonderful career for me. Um, been able to work with uh, and meet so many uh, great people over the years and have gotten so much support um, in getting all these projects done. Uh, that's a long list. There are still a few on that list that are not done, but hopefully they're moving along well enough that they'll get done in the next uh, few years. Um, I, you know, had a choice between going to Santa Barbara or going to Santa Cruz back in 19. And um, so happy I picked uh, Santa Cruz. It's been a great place to live, and um, I'm just happy to have contributed uh, this to the, these projects of the community where where I do uh, live and play all the time. Um, I'm looking forward to less stress because <laughs> it's not always easy getting these things done, um, but also. It, it's been exciting. I mean, there's just been a lot of wonderful people I've worked with, uh, the council, the commissions, and in particularly the staff that I've worked with over the years. They've just all been a bunch of wonderful people, and there is a great team of engineers and technical staff uh, at Public Works that are going to, you know, do a lot of great things in the in the future here. Um, you know, and also just thankful for my parents for. Um, bringing us to the United States when I was a baby and uh, encouraged me to become an engineer and to go to college and all those things. Uh, I wish that they had had an opportunity to, you know, see me graduate and um, become an engineer and become the person that uh, they had hoped for. Um, again, it's just, you know, it's just been great and I really appreciate your guys' support. Thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. uh, happy to Mark, please, please go ahead. Yeah, I, you know, Chris is an amazing employee. I've had the opportunity to work with him for 21 years, and um, he he just finds a way to get it done, and it's great. Uh, we've all benefited from that, and he has developed a strong team. He's really focused on um, building building that team. He's why he's had to do it several times as he's seen people grow and and get promoted and sometimes move on and then he'll rebuild them. But he, we have a very solid team and I, I'm really just thankful for the opportunity I had to work with Chris um, this past time and watch his um, orchestra of, of pull, pulling the funding together and getting, the, getting projects permitted through um, multiple different agencies and very complicated projects sometimes took years, but uh, he had the persistence and the wherewithal to get it done. And so I just want to um, congratulate him on his upcoming retirement and wish him all the best. Um, he's done, he's really delivered from for public works. Um, and it, like you said, anytime that you walk or ride a bike or drive a vehicle, you're either going to drive over a bridge that he's had his hands on or uh, an intersection or uh, road repair and that type of thing. So he's just trying to keep everybody safe and um, it's just been great. So Chris, I wish, please join me in wishing Chris all the best in his upcoming retirement. Um, I just hope all the best for you. Thank you. And Martin Bernal has his hand up. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. Yes, Chris, I also wanted to just uh, really thank you so much for all of your hard work and dedication all of these years. Um, you know, Chris is very tenacious and, you know, the list of accomplishment is pretty tremendous. Uh, and uh, I think as Mark uh, mentioned, uh, a lot of what gets the public's attention are those 
controversial projects or those sort of big issues, but so much of what the city does, the vast majority of what the city does are the day-to-day -day things that uh, we all take for granted, like when you wake up in the morning and uh, you can flush the toilet or open up the, mm -hmm. uh, go out in the street, and, and that's what the, a lot of what Public Works does, and a lot of what Chris really also focused on, which is making sure that uh, we have the quality of life and the level of services that we are really, uh, really high in our community, and so, um, that and also the other part of Chris, what he's done is uh, really work to create staff out in the uh, in his to really take that on and to continue that that high level of, of service. So again, thank you, Chris. Uh, yeah, you'll be missed for sure. Thank you. Council members, any 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 uh, comments or anything? Lots of thumbs up. <laughs> Justin, go ahead. And Martin. Yeah, after Justin. Yeah, Chris, I'll just say, you know, thank you so much for all your years of service. Um, there's a lot of really great projects that have come through, and I know that, for example, the Trestle Bridge, when that got finished, so many people were just expressing how much better it was and how much they loved the improvements. And additionally, with the rail trail, I know so many people are enjoying that space, along with all the other places that people probably don't think of, you know, when it, when it comes to getting around the city. And um, and since you so many years of working on those projects and making sure they came forward to the community, um, just wanted to say thanks and congratulations on your retirement. I mean, hope to, hope to see you around more. Martine? I too just wanted to say congratulations to you, Chris, and how much I've appreciated working with you and the legacy to leave behind in terms of the impact that you've had in such a positive way to our community. I've always just really appreciated your professionalism, just your ability to stay the course and to offer information to us as best as we can to make these decisions that are good for our community. And I just, I enjoyed your story about your parents, how incredible, and of course, they're, I'm sure, looking down, very proud. Um, I wish you the absolute best in your, in your retirement. And it's nice to know that you've had the ability to, to mentor other folks so that the legacy lives on in that way too. So congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Brown. I'll just add my appreciation here. Um, you know, Chris, your, um, your knowledge and experience, your tenacity and your commitment to uh, you know, public transit and, and getting uh, transportation projects done, getting moving them through under very challenging circumstances often is really unparalleled. Um, you know, I just appreciate the support that you've given me as a council member and also uh, as a commissioner for the RTC. Um, you know, even when I'm being difficult, <laughs> you are, um, you know, very patient and, and helpful. So um, really, really well-deserved. And yes, what a wonderful legacy as um, council member uh, Watkins said, um, I hope you get to enjoy some of the fruits of your labor by um, getting out there on the, the rail trip and um, out around the town. Um, we'll, we'll be thinking of you and um, looking forward to hearing what happens next for you and um, just wish you all the best. Thank you. Council Member Contrary Johnson. Thank you, Chris. I haven't had the um, opportunity to work with you for very long, um, but from what I hear and I see, you are clearly very committed for all your years of service and, and everything that you've brought to our community. Um, and I was really touched by your story, it really resonated. Um, so thank you for all your work and congratulations and hope to cross paths on the rail trail. Thanks. <laughs> Chris, yeah, Chris and I ran into each other a couple of weeks ago out on the porch of a local restaurant. That was kind of a fun little uh, night just to just to chat. And I could see that you are ready to be ready to be done and have more time to do the things like bike riding and other stuff. So go out and enjoy. And um, yeah, thanks for everything you've done. So enjoy. We'll see you around town. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. And you know, I'm I'm not done. I'll potentially be working on more local projects, issues, et cetera, as I continue to live here, I'm not going anywhere. So I do hope I see you all um, as uh, time moves on. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Congrats. All right. Okay.
Okay, we have one more mayoral proclamation, um, which is a big one. Um, this is declaring August 26, 2021 as Martin Bernal Day. And it is my pleasure, Martin, to, to read this proclamation to you. Martin, just as a note, Martin was my boss when I did get um, to the city, whatever, how many years ago that was. So it's a kind of a crazy uh, situation that I'm re reading this uh, proclamation right now, Martin, for you. <laughs> Uh, whereas Martin Bernal retires after more than 30 years of dedicated public service to the cities of San Jose, Mountain View, and the best of all, Santa Cruz, with a focus on service, community sacrifice, and caring. And whereas Martin Bernal has logged incalculable hours in city council meetings, most in the past two years, <laughs> along a bevy of mayors, 11 as well as 22 unique and distinctively fun council members with patience to diplomacy and compromise. And whereas Martin Bernal has survived the above, as well as teaching his blind uncle how to drive a tractor, incrementing his not so super secret monkey password in numeric increments, the origin of his monkey collection remains murky, and crashing his bike at least four times that we know of, once while teaching his son how to ride properly, and once that resulted in enough metal being put in his wrist that he triggers TSA alarm bells at every airport. And whereas Martin Bernal has brought to our city the Amgen Tour of California, the Santa Cruz Warriors, Kaiser Arena, Blurry Seal Galore, Roundabouts, Rail Trail Improvements, five successful revenue measures, new and renovated libraries and green bike lanes, the latter of which we may have done to try to reduce his bike accidents and therefore his medical bills. And whereas Martin Bernal wrapped up his amazing career here at the city by leading our way through an intense local wildfire as well as a global pandemic. And whereas all of Martin Bernal's colleagues at the city of Santa Cruz and throughout our region, former and present, wish him the very best retirement and every success in his future efforts, including during the, during, doing the Bernal family laundry up to exacting standards, making delicious drinks and cakes for tea parties with his granddaughter and her stuffed animals, not driving his mountain bike off of embankments or into mountains, and things without breaking gas or water mains, of course, all, this, all with the requisite permits and generally relaxing and spending quality time with his family. Now, therefore, I, Donna Myers, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim August 26, 2021, as Martin Bernal Day in the City of Santa Cruz and call upon all of his colleagues, fellow community members to join me in thanking him for his quiet leadership and exemplary service to the City of Santa Cruz and wishing him the happiest and safest, please be careful on your bike, Martin, of retirement and certainly well-deserved. Um, Martin, thank you for everything you've done. I'd like to ask um, the uh, to please turn on their cameras. Because I know um, many of them, uh, you know, are here for you today to celebrate you today and uh, want to make sure um, they can, um, you know, uh, give you a virtual ovation, a virtual thumbs up, whatever they wish. So department heads, let's do that virtual ovation right now. We wish we, we, we could be in, uh, in person with you, Martin, but I know you have a lot of colleagues who are, um, you know, really, really of mixed minds today, I'm sure. So uh, a mixed emotions. Oh, and Andy's holding up things upside down, Andy. So. <laughs> Um, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, so I'm happy if there's any department heads that would like to say a few things, please feel free. We're, we're actually running right on time, so and I'll, I'll call on you, and as well as, um, as, well as my council colleagues. Uh, Chris Schneider. I'm not a department head, but um, I just <laughs> have to you know, pay back to Martin for his kind comments. It's been a pleasure working with Martine over the years as assistant city manager and city manager. Um, you know, that's part of the success. My success has been, you know, his involvement in helping move things along as well. Um, our, our boys were in elementary school together. And so as a result of that, we ended up becoming friends and riding together over the years. 
Um, not so much since he's been a city manager. I think at times it's just been too much, taking too much of his time away from fun stuff. So I'm looking forward to us riding, being able to ride together again. So thanks, Martine. Thank you, Chris. Any others? Uh, Rosemary. So I've probably not been here as long as some of the other people who are on this call or watching today, but I do want to say that, you know, I've had the luxury of working in four different places for four different bosses and four different kinds of bosses, and I really appreciated the kind of um, hands-off and very supportive engagement that uh, Martine has with his department head. I think it's been a really uh, the privilege to work for somebody who has as much trust in you and who engages with you as a kind of a colleague and an equal advises and supports and really helps you to do the best that you can be. So um, I remember when I came to this department or to this job in this interview, they asked me what the heck I was trying to do with my life. And I said, I'm looking for interesting, challenging work and you definitely have it here. And I said, and I'm looking for an organization that wants me to do what I'm capable of doing. And Martine and Tina and Laura and all of the staff here have really provided it and it's been a privilege. So thank you so much. Um, and I, I appreciate everything that you've done for me and for my organization and for the city. And Mark? Yeah, I just wanna echo those comments. Um, I actually first worked with Martine back at the city of San Jose when he was out of the city manager's office and I was in public works and he came around doing some sort of interview or asking questions. I really didn't think much of what he was working on and didn't think where he was gonna, and you never know. And, it, and 10 years later, I'm working for um, the city of Santa Cruz as he is and he's the assist, uh, assistant city manager and becomes the city manager. So. Um, but he's a great uh, individual to work for, um, cares so much about the organization and the city um, in the good times and in the hard times when we had to tighten our belt. Um, wasn't He was very straight with everything we needed to do and, and we carried that through and just pretty st a very strong leadership, but allowed the department heads to manage their departments, which is critical because um, Nobody can manage everything. And, and I think being able to do that and trust in those individuals, he got excellent results. And I just appreciate that opportunity to work for you, Martine. Um, it's been a great event and I wish you all the best. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I have Councilmember Watkins and then Councilmember Cummings. I, I appreciate hearing what um, the department heads have to say. I think that's really telling of your leadership, Martine, and um, what an incredible organization and legacy you have as well here. I too want to just, you know, congratulate you and thank you for your service. It is not an easy job by any means. Having now seen uh, for the four years that I've, four and a half years that I've been on council, um, your role and your availability and your uh, willingness to um, stay calm amongst a lot of high energy and to really understand the importance of maintaining our, our city function and what we're doing and how to best serve our community. Um, you are you absolutely deserve uh, this time to enjoy your family and to enjoy other hobbies and experiences safely, <laughs> hopefully, as you go biking. Um, but we really wishing you all the well. And and I just you know how much I've had a chance to learn from you as well. Um, even though there were things that we maybe not always agreed on, it was always really professional. And you always helped me understand your perspective and respected that and getting used to saying Martine to the only other Martine I've had to work with. So anyways, congratulations and wishing you the absolute best. Council member coming. Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, congratulations on all these years of service and work to, you know, communities, not just in Santa Cruz, but throughout, you know, this region, but most importantly, Santa Cruz, because um, it's really, you know, being a city manager here after, after seeing, you know, and learning more about what your role is, it's not an easy job and definitely not an easy job in Santa Cruz um, because we are a very vocal and passionate community and it takes a special person to be able to try to meet the needs of, of everything that's coming forward. And, um, you know, 
Um, you've been able to be there during really tough times and help us recover from the uh, first recession and have been you know, really working with us to try to keep us out of going into a deep recession after the pandemic. And, um, and having you know, spent time working with you last year, which is probably one of the most challenging years in the history of the city, um, it was you know, really great to be able to have somebody and to know that we had a city manager who was really putting you know, workers first and the community first. And so um, just want to thank you for everything that you've been able to do to help the community. And I know we'll probably be calling you even in retirement. So um, look forward to seeing you around and, and working with you more in the future. Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. Yeah, thank you, Martin, for um, certainly everything that you contributed to the city, your leadership um, over the last decades. And um, I want to thank you personally for, for the support you've given me as a, a new council member, a newly elected official, just always being um, available and super responsive in answering my questions that maybe are um, some of them are probably just so obvious to you, um, but just, you know, always breaking things down for me and, and being available for me. So I really, really appreciated the support I got from you um, over the last almost year. We're coming up on a year. Um, and I wish you all the best. And, and it is a small community. So we'll be, we'll be moving out of the way as you ride your bike um, and waving hi. Thank you. Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you. Um, Martine, I also uh, share uh, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson's sentiments being a newly elected council member. Um, I just want to thank your leadership, your, your support, very supportive, um, professional, calm and patient, and always available via text, via call. Um, and to explain uh, even the details and the big picture and historical context valuable in so many situations and so many questions that I had. So um, I don't know if you remember, we first met when you were uh, assistant city manager. Um, and I, I think I sat on a, a, a task force, downtown task force or whatnot. And I remember that's when I met Mark Dettel and, and you, and um, you always had some good insights. So um, I appreciate that. I thank you for what you've brought in this challenging month that we've had um, and always directing me in the right uh, way. Uh, so thank you. I hope to continue running into you and your adorable granddaughter. And I wish you all the best. Congratulations. Council member Golder. I don't really have a lot new new things to add, but I too want to um, thank you for all of your years of service to the city. And I think before I was on council, I didn't realize quite how much you did and your calm presence City Hall is always appreciated. I know sometimes people come in hot and, you know, everyone's very passionate that's on council and um, in the community. And I feel like your, just your humble, calm presence really simmers everything down and um, gets the work done that needs to be done. And I'll definitely miss seeing you in that office, but I'm sure I'll keep seeing you out on the trails and in the community. And I'm just happy you're able to enjoy your retirement after all these years of um, hard work and service. So thank you. Council member Brown. I'll, I'll just add my, um, my congratulations and appreciation for all of your time that you've spent dedicated to the city and you know to, to really working in the public interest. Um, and just say, um, our loss is Penelope's gain and um, your other family members too. And you know, well deserved that you get to spend time with them and do what you love and um, we'll be here. So we'll I'm sure see you um, out and about in town. And like others have said, uh, we'll call on you for um, that uh, the universal lifeline help when we are looking for, for answers. So take good care. 
Well, I know we'll celebrate you again on uh, Thursday, Martine, at City Hall, but um, there goes my dog. Uh, but I just wanted to again say thank you for everything you've done for the city over the years, and um, we look forward to, to doing some more celebrating with you on Thursday. And, um, uh, you know, just wish you all the best. You know, enjoy Santa Cruz. Um, you get to be around town and not worry about all the list of things that you probably see when you go out and about. <laughs> so somebody else's job at least for a while so um yeah enjoy your time and your family congrats thank you thank you um i just uh, just want to say a few brief, brief things uh, thank you very much that was that was very 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 nice i very much appreciate it and uh just really briefly it really has been an honor and work for the city of santa cruz uh, truly and uh, i've had a very rewarding uh, public service career and most of it is was noted here in santa cruz and uh, for good reason um, you know i've just been really fortunate to work with so many uh, great people you know that are talented caring uh, and really dedicated to their work and to making santa cruz a better place everything from uh, elected officials from our city other cities from the region uh, community members so many community members uh, department heads, uh, managers, supervisors, uh, employees of the city, uh, colleagues in the, in, in the profession. Uh, it's really been incredible. And I really owe a lot of uh, thanks to, to them because ultimately, uh, you know, it's, it was teamwork, it was everybody working together, everybody's passion that made things happen. And, uh, you know, Santa Cruz is a small community as, as is was noted. Uh, uh, you, if you talk to anyone, eventually there'll be some connection that, that comes that arises. It's, it's very common, and it wasn't unusual for me. A lot of people watch city council meetings more than you would uh, uh, expect uh, for some reason. Uh, so it's not uncommon for me to go around the city for people to to comment. A lot of the comments I got were, you know, people feeling somewhat sorry for me or saying you have the hardest job in the world. And that might be true. However, I have to say it is probably one of the most rewarding uh, jobs you can have. It really truly is. And I'm certainly very, very proud of the tremendous accomplishments that, that have been made. And the accomplishments that happen in, in local government really happen over many, many years. They don't happen overnight. And the other part that's really, really critical is, is responding to crisis. And uh, in Santa Cruz, we have them, uh, whether they're natural crisis or latest with the pandemics or fires or, whatever, or economic, whatever it might be. And being able to respond to those things and take care of the community is really super essential and critical. And I think I feel really, really, really uh, proud of what we've done in, in that arena as well. So we're very lucky to be able to live in this community and to raise, have raised my family here. And uh, I, I do look forward to continuing to see all of you around town. And uh, uh, it's been, mm, I guess two years since I haven't broken the bones. I hope to keep keep that up. So uh, I'll enjoy uh, the community and uh, I'll, I'll try to stay safe. So thank you very much. Thanks, Martine. We will see you uh, in the courtyard in a couple of days. Okay, we'll move on to our next set of agenda items. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast on Community Television Channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on agenda item today, instructions are provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move into an agenda item that will be opened up for public comment. Please note, public comment is heard only on items council is taking act and not regular updates and reports. The items that will be open for public comment during today's meeting are numbers 13 through 31, excuse me, with the exception of item 27 on our agenda. I'd like to ask the council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. Seeing none, uh, I'd like to ask- I have one. Clerk Oh, I'm sorry, Sonia. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. Uh, item number 29, uh, there are specific components to downtown businesses. So out of an abundance of caution, I will not be participating in item 29. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'll make a note of that during that item. I'd like to ask the city clerk to announce any additions and deletions. There are none. Great. We'll move on to um, 
uh, oral communications. Uh, oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. Oral communications will occur immediately after agenda item number 31 today. If you wish to make a comment during oral communications, please call in during, excuse me, please call in towards the end of item 31. Move on to um, our city attorney providing a report on our closed session. Yes, good afternoon, Mayor Myers, members of the city council. Uh, this morning, the council met in closed session at 10 a.m. Uh, by Zoom to discuss the following items. The first item was uh, public employment uh, involving the city manager recruitment. Uh, item two was a conference with labor negotiators. The council met with and gave instructions to uh, their negotiator uh, concerning the SEIU temporary employees. Item three was an item of uh, significant exposure to litigation. The council received a report from uh, the city attorney uh, on that item. Item four involves three uh, items of pending litigation. The first is the matter of City of Santa Cruz versus Richard L. Santee et al. Um, the second is the matter of Don Stevens et al. versus the Regents of the University of California. The third item is the, the matter entitled Habitat and Watership Caretakers et al. versus the Regents of the University of California. Cases are currently pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court. Uh, the last item was real property negotiations. The council received a report from its negotiator and gave instructions concerning the property at 125 Coral Street. Um, there was no reportable action. Thank you, Mr. Kandati. I'll move on to the city manager report now, item number 11. The city manager will report and provide updates, the city's business, COVID-19 response and events. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you, Mayor and City Council. Um, a number of items today, very briefly. Um, I'll start with uh, first, uh, just some, uh, just got some recent uh, uh, information regarding the COVID um, from the county. Um, some good news, uh, the, they're letting us know that the re reproduction rate of the virus, the RT number, is now under zero and is projected to continue to, to, to decline. And that means that the number of uh, uh, individuals that are being infected, uh, they're being transmitted, the infections being transmitted to is, is uh, declining. And so the infection rate has uh, slowed uh, and its rate has increased. Uh, and the 14 day projection is now for a very steep decline in the rate. So that's good. That means that uh, we're looking at the uh, infections out there and, and the steep decline is good. Um, and then uh, the other, uh, just wanted to note that there is a, um, on August 25th, uh, and, and uh, Mayor, you might want to add more about this, is the, on August 25th at 5 p.m. will be the second mayor's green economy roundtable on green jobs in the bill. Uh, so I just want to make sure that everyone's aware of that. And then uh, I'd like to ask uh, our police chief to kind of do an update on the, you all recall we had that ride out event this past weekend we had all those writers, many of which you know, wreaked havoc on our community. And so I'd like to ask uh, our, our police, I'm sorry, our, yes, our police chief to kind of comment on, on, on some of the follow-up with respect to that or the impacts of that. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Martine. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to communicate with uh, Mayor Myers and the rest of city council on what took place over the weekend. <clears throat> if I can back up just a little bit on April 21st of last, uh, this year, I uh, met via phone with the organizer and discussed the event from the previous year and told him that he needed a permit to have another event here in our town because of the behaviors of what took place the previous year. He said he understood that and would try. Uh, evidently, that was not done. And then uh, I was alerted to this particular event uh, the evening before from a council member who text messaged me a screenshot of a, a potential ride, not necessarily uh, uh, alerting us to the scope of the ride, but that there was going to be a ride. And uh, we regularly don't monitor people's private social media accounts or public media accounts unless there's a criminal predicate that would allow us to take a look, uh, recognizing that crime is taking place. 
if that is the case, then we can uh, monitor social media accounts. Uh, that was not the case here, uh, and certainly we don't want to be in a position where we're spying on everybody in our community uh, without a criminal predicate. So uh, the morning of the event, it became apparent that this was a repeat of the one last year. So uh, myself and my day watch sergeant met with the organizer at about 11 o'clock in the morning, including wearing body-worn cameras. Uh, to videotape and to have a discussion with him about the uh, event and ask for him to give clear direction to those that were there. Uh, and when it became apparent that it could not cancel this event, to stay on the right side of the street and obey traffic laws, that obviously was not done. Uh, recognizing scope and the size of the event, he told us this could be about 5,000 people, and it certainly appeared that way from going over to Harvey West Park, where there was a large setup uh, on city property. And we put out information via social media uh, to as many people as we could as quickly as possible that there would be traffic problems within our city. Uh, we also immediately began calling in extra officers to try to manage the problem. You have to remember that we have about five to 10 officers working on any day, and that morning we had five officers working on a Saturday morning. Uh, it takes a while to get people to come in, as you, as you can imagine, they're getting off of work at one or two or three in the morning, and so to call them to wake them up to get them back into work uh, can be a pretty, uh, pretty big task. We also met with the California Highway Patrol, Capitola Police, and the Santa Cruz Sheriff's Office, and we all discussed this event. So we didn't, at that point, know that the route was that we did expect it to go into other jurisdictions. And we agreed on the tactics, the enforcement profile of how to manage this large of a group. And uh, we also made sure that there were assets in place in case of a critical incident uh, taking place in, in, in and amongst the ride. We agreed on that, we worked together, kept in constant communication with CPD as the lead, since it was mostly in our jurisdiction. And uh, we were able to uh, manage it fairly well, given the fact that there was enormous uh, traffic problems as a result. It was certainly tantamount to what we would normally see on a very sunny, a hot beach day where it takes a lot of time to move through town. Uh, I sat at the interstate. Uh, Murray and Seabright and timed it, and it took about 20 to 25 minutes for all the riders to get through the intersection. That's unacceptable in our community, especially when it's preventable, and we you know, we all recognize that. We also experienced a three-fold increase in calls for service uh, during the day, and that can be, as you can imagine, uh, pretty difficult uh, trying to manage all those calls for service as well as additional 5,000 people riding down our streets and some on the sidewalks. Overall, most of the riders were, other than traffic violations, compliant and, uh, and were there to enjoy themselves with their families. However, there were several of the riders who decided that they would take it into their own hands and that they would create problems. And so we responded to those incidents, trying to manage those and protect citizens as much as possible with uh, about five officers working in the entire city and still handling calls for service and, and so forth. Uh, most of the calls for service were traffic related or disturbances, arguments between riders and motorists. There were, however, uh, there was, however, one assault that we documented and there very well could have been more. Uh, one gentleman was assaulted downtown trying to block riders from riding up the sidewalk. And uh, that is completely unacceptable. We are working that case. We are trying to identify through videotape uh, and body-worn cameras. Uh, we had volunteers close by who tried to intervene uh, to uh, prosecute that person. And if we are able to identify them, we absolutely will uh, prosecute them to the full extent of the law. Uh, we also, at the end of the event, which took about four hours to get through the entire city, uh, going uh, from Harvey West Park, downtown, out to the west side, and then back over to the east side, out to 7th Street in the sheriff's area, and then back down SoCal. Uh, 
we uh, got a hold of the organizer. I brought him over to the police department. We cited him for having a large major event without a permit. I also called the sheriff's office and they cited him also. We are continuing to work with the city attorney to explore other options for civil recourse on uh, suing him or uh, lever leveraging things uh, or compensating us for the overtime that we had to pay to bring people in from home, as well as the staff time of uh, people coming in, including managers on the weekend to come in and handle this, uh, this situation. In the future, uh, he took, according to his own words, I take full responsibility and this is my last year. Uh, I hope that is the case, but rather than just hoping, we need to go farther than that and make sure that that does not happen again. Without adequate, adequate permitting, as well as a traffic safety plan in place to make sure that it is managed correctly if it were to take place. But at this point, I am certainly not interested in uh, approving a plan like that uh, without the enormous amount of resources and the appropriate permits uh, being pulled and approved by the city. <clears throat> I would be happy to entertain any questions you might have. <clears throat> questions from council members? Council member Boulder? I just want to say thank you, Andy, for that um, very thorough update. I know I'm sure just like the rest of the council uh, received a lot of correspondence from neighbors, business owners, community members, and family members with reports of behaviors that were just unacceptable. And it's just disappointing because I think all of us really um, enjoy bicycling and would really like to see, you know, a positive bike friendly, family friendly event Unfortunately, there was just, um, this, this did not appear to be that. Um, it was, and, you know, I crossed paths with them at several points during the day, and I, I would, you know, agree with the community on that. So um, thank you. Any other comments or questions for Andy? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll, I'll just echo the same thing, um, uh, Chief Mills. Um, yeah, I've just got a lot of, um, saw a lot of people and people were, you know, it, it, it did not feel like a safe situation. It didn't feel um, like a friendly group of people. Um, it was really, really upsetting to a lot of people. So um, I appreciate your work and um, certainly um, really question whether this, this organizer is really someone that we would wanna, you know, really invite to back to Santa Cruz at all. I mean, if, you know, it's, it's just, yeah, it just was not a good event. And uh, it was disturbing to see some of the um, the one individual that was um, beat up. And then I've also heard of other folks, you know, having their car doors kicked in and I don't know, just really not appropriate behavior. So I appreciate, but um, I also acknowledge that um, trying to address something that large with the few staff that we had would have been very, very uh, uh, difficult and dangerous for our, for our police force. So I appreciate sort of your and the limitations that um, you were left with that day. So thank you for, your, and please thank your officers for their work that day. It must've been pretty uh, pretty tough to deal with. Uh, Council member Cummings. Thank you. And I, I, I share the same sentiments. I think that many of my, that Mayor Meyer Gold have expressed, and I think many people in the community as well. And, you know, I don't know if there's follow-up conversations with the, individual who organized this, but um, my understanding is that the individual who was um, assaulted downtown ends up having to go to the hospital and was homeless. And, you know, for a, a homeless individual who's really trying to look out for the community to, um, you know, then be assaulted and, you know, understanding that our, our medical industry expensive, you know, that organizer, that community is willing to put up some money to help pay for his bills. I think that would be a good, you know, a gesture of good faith. And I don't know if there's anything that any way that that can be included with um, follow up through the city attorney's office. But, um, you know, I think that this organizer didn't do their part in trying to create a safe event. And as a result, uh, members of our, of our community were hurt. And I think that they should be held accountable for um, the pain that was inflicted on people who were just trying to enjoy their day. Thank you, council member. Any other comments or questions? Martine, is that all on your report? I was going to ask uh, Lee Butler to just do a very brief update on homelessness. Oh, great. Thank you. Welcome, Lee. Thank 
you, Mayor Myers and Council Members. Hello. We are um, planning to give a, a larger update um, at the next um, regular council meeting, but just briefly, we are um, exploring the approach um, for uh, safe sleeping, as was um, uh, identified as part of the um, Camping Services and Standards Ordinance. We are also um, uh, communicating with Housing Matters regarding um, their operations there and um, the uh, continuation of existing um, services um, and the um, incorporation of new services through the 120 units of permanent supportive housing that they have at the rear of that site. And um, we're also um, looking at um, coordinating with the state as well, as you all know, the um, $14.5 million that was identified for the city of Santa Cruz to use towards homelessness services. We've been um, considering uh, potential options for the use of that money and we're looking to um, coordinate with uh, both John Laird and uh, Mark Stone's offices so that um, we can understand um, what that money, um, what the timelines are um, and how that um, can potentially be uh, utilized. Um, we also recently commented on um, the state uh, project home key um, uh, upcoming grant uh, considerations. They, um, as you know, are releasing round two and uh, they asked cities um, for um, and counties for comments. And some of the things that uh, we commented on were the potential for a um, a specific um, pot of money for our region um, rather than one that would be competitive um, throughout the state, as well as a desire to allow for a broader spectrum of uses. Um, as you all know, uh, the initial round focused on um, conversion of residential um, properties or motel properties into um, permanent supportive housing, and we were um, desiring some additional flexibility um, and how those funds could potentially be used. Um, so we're um, looking for that uh, notice of funding availability to be released in the next month or so, um, pending um, any delays that, that may happen in kind of the timeline that we would anticipate. And I'm available for any questions that you may have. Is there any questions from council members on this? I'm not seeing any. Great. Well, thank you, Lee, and we look forward to a broader update next in two weeks. Thanks very much. Is that it, Marty? Well, that's it. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Though. Any questions for anything uh, uh, for city management? Marty, I have to say it's your last city manager report. So thanks again. Thank <laughs> little little thing throughout the day. Uh, our next item is, um, I'd just like to call on the city clerk to provide any updates to the calendar at this time, to the city council calendar. I have that. Great. And I'd just I'd like uh, to. I wanted to, if, if I could um, comment on the, the, the calendar. Um, I have had a number of members of the public who've still been reaching out to me regarding the SB 35 study session. And given that this is kind of like the only forum where we can all kind of discuss these things together, I put together a motion based on council or based on community input, and I sent it over to Bonnie Sutton. But really what it is, it's just trying to ensure that some information that and concerns that's being brought up by the community are addressed. So I wanted to move that, um, that to direct staff to provide the following information in addition to any other information being provided at the September 7th study session. One, the procedure for de designating the city council as the city's approval body for any SB 35 applications, requests for density bonuses. Two, the city council's role in acting to approve or deny any proposed density bonus requests for concessions and waivers. And three, the requirement as part of any SB 35 application requesting a density bonus for the council like to receive financial documentation provided by the applicant supporting the proposed density bonus request. 
And so this is just to ensure that this information, um, in addition to any other information, is included in the in the presentation on September 7th. Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I'll second that. I um, appreciate the most. I think that it um, it does provide some additional detail for clarity that I think um, some of us at least are looking have been looking for um, in my conversations with uh, folks around the E31 water project in particular because that is the first uh, streamlining application we've received and this is really new new terrain and I know Vice Mayor Brunner suggested doing a study session like this so thank you for that. Um, I do think that it would be helpful to make sure that um, that these areas we, you know we get some clarity and, and are able to have some discussion on the seventh. So um, um, yeah I, I absolutely support this. Thank you Councilmember Cummings. Yeah I was going to make an announcement actually um, that we have studied we have uh, we have scheduled a study session um, just as part of this item just so that the public is aware. The study session um, has been announced um, and the staff is is focused on the exact things in the motion so that has already been directed to staff in terms of you know ways as um, at least in my ability to call a meeting so we've done a special meeting with these exact items was uh, that was called last week uh, we have notified many of the neighborhood groups that have been watching this um, process and uh, are concerned about the uh, development in their community there so um, we certainly have uh, already put this in motion and uh, so um, yeah we'll just go ahead and do a vote um, the other thing I just wanted to announce um, on on this because these are both special study session well one's a public hearing and one is a special meeting uh, we'll also be holding a public um, hearing on the district election process that is scheduled for next week, next Tuesday, August 31st at 4.30 p.m. And that will include a presentation by staff as well as our um, demograph demographer uh, and provide information and ability for people to um, participate in a on our district election process, which we are just initiating. And then secondly, um, yes, September 7th at 7.30 p.m. We will be holding a special uh, session on uh, the SB 35 law, which um, obviously is now being utilized for one of a development in our community. Um, so there will be a briefing on that um, from our staff. And uh, Lee, I don't know if you have any updates on that at all, if you wanna share anything on the agenda, but certainly that will be uh, starting at 7.30 p.m. on uh, on September 7th, which is a Tuesday. Lee, do you have anything to add with, at all? And I don't want to get out of over my skis here, Tony. I just want to make sure that people know what's going to be on that on that special study session. No, I think it's been adequately captured. We're going to cover um, SB 35 as well as uh, there have been um, some legislative changes to SB 35. That government code section has changed, so the subsequent changes um, to that government code section as well as density bonus information. Thank you, and thank you, Lee, to your staff for making this happen. I know that we uh, sort of sprung this on you pretty <laughs> pretty quickly, so appreciate your ability to get your staff together and provide that 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 uh, study session for folks to participate in. And we will be taking public comment during that during that study session. Uh, Councilmember Watkins. Uh, no, I I, I want to thank you also, Mayor and um, Lee, for yep the staff ability to bring this together. I think the community has definitely been asking for a study session on this. And I wonder if, if Lee, you're the best person to kind of maybe forward our questions in advance that we've gotten from constituents about SB 35 and and that all, although it has been directed in this motion that we can include some of those so that you have um, kind of a purview into what some of the community is concerned or kind of some of their questions are about. Of course, that'd be fine. Okay, right. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor. Uh, we'll go ahead and call for a roll call vote. Thank you. Council members Watkins? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. <clears throat> Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers. Aye. That uh, motion passes unanimously. 
We'll now move on to our consent agenda. First up, it, these items are 13 through 24 on our agenda today. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you wanna comment on items 13 through 24. Instructions are on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device, press star nine to raise your hand and listen for the cue saying you have been unmuted. Acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment on or pull any item? Council member Cummings and council member Calantar Johnson. Um, uh, thank you, I'd like to comment on item number 15 and pull item number 23. Uh, council member Calantari Johnson. I comment with for 15 as well. Mm -hmm. And Vice Mayor Bruner. Uh, the same uh, comment on 15 and uh, item 23. I'm gonna pull uh, that also. Yeah. Okay, that'll be pulled. And council member Brown. I have uh, questions on item 20 and 28. I, I don't need to pull them. Okay. 20 and 28. Okay, great. Okay, so we'll go ahead and um, we have item number 23 will be pulled. So we're going to move, uh, go ahead and um, take comments and questions from council. Uh, why don't we start with comments? Uh, three council members um, have comments on item 15, which is the City of Santa Cruz Climate Action Plan 2020 closeout report. And I'll uh, start with council member Cummings and then council member Colantari Johnson and then Vice Mayor Bruce. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, express my appreciation to Tiffany and to everyone in the community for all of their hard work on the 2020 Climate Action Plan. Um, just reading through that agenda report, and if people haven't had a chance to look at it, I encourage everyone in our community to really take a look at that because we have, you know, through that report, we've been demonstrating that we're making some real progress towards reducing our carbon print um, in the state of California and, you know, on our climate as a whole. And so I just really want to um, express my gratitude to Tiffany for all the work that she's done because this isn't easy. And um, I know people want to see us, you know, um, reduce all carbon emissions immediately, but, you know, it takes a, lo a lot of work to figure out what kind of projects we can implement um, at the city level and make our city, our city uh, an example. And I know we've won numerous awards over the past few years and um, really is attributed to all the hard work that Tiffany has put into this and um, our other city staff and our community. So again, thank you. And I'm looking forward to our 2030 climate action plan and us really trying to keep on this track of reducing our carbon emissions. Council member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you, yeah, I'd like to echo um, those sentiments as well. Thank you, Tiffany and um, your team and everyone in the community who has done so much work. Um, I was just really blown away by the indicators that, that highlighted we we've, we've almost um, across the board have, have met or close to met or exceeded so many indicators. Um, and then the focus on equity, that really stood out to me as well, that, that we, we are looking at equity outcomes as well as our process and ensuring equity in our process. So just thank you for um, the thoughtfulness and um, clearly it has had an Im impact already in our community um, towards getting us to where we need to be. So thank you. Thank you, council member. And I have Vice Mayor Bruner as well. Thank you. Uh, I just, I know this is a closeout report, but I felt after reading this agenda item that I wanted to comment and um, just uh, say thank you to the commitment to equitable climate action through the various plans and resolutions of work that went into this. And um, it's pretty amazing. So thank you. Thank you to Tiffany and thank you to the team. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, Council Member Brown, I'll go on to your questions. I think you said 20 and 28, but I think 
we're at the end of, let's see here, just make sure here. Um, 28 is on our general business. Did you mean um, another item on consent? Sorry, um, one sec. Um, let me just, I, I thought it was 28. I'm so sorry. That's okay. um, I am talking about um, 20. Oh, uh, yeah. No, got it. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, so, so item uh, 20, then I'll just do questions about that. I thought 28 was on the consent agenda. Okay. Well. okay. Item 20. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is about for those who are out there uh, who don't have the agenda right in front of you. This is related to the Riverwalk lighting project that um, we are hoping to get moving. And the and I want to just say thank you to the public work staff for really taking seriously the. Um, the IDA uh, recommendations here and, and really taking steps to make sure that um, we are doing everything we can to comply with, um, you know, dark skies guidelines around, um, you know, wildlife um, and, um, and really and human uh, impacts of lighting on the river. And so I just, ha I do have a couple of questions that are a little bit detailed. Sorry, I didn't get them to you in advance, but I just wanted to kind of see if I could get a sense of um, where um, the timelines are at and, and monitoring to kind of see how, to see if the, the uh, measures that you have proposed will achieve the goals. Um, and so um, just in, I guess, a summary question, and then I can, if the, the appropriate person would be, um, I guess, Mark, I'll send you, um, send you my specific questions just to kind of get have a little more conversation but um just um if you could give us give us an overview of the environmentally friendly modifications that you um you know you you did include here as a result of that review um just you know just kind of the basics so we know what it is that you're looking at specifically um that um that we should be uh paying attention to Okay, well, this is uh, Chris Schneider, Assistant Thanks, Director of Public Works. I've been working uh, with my staff and with a lighting uh, consultant and expert on, um, you know, modeling the lighting that we originally proposed for the levy. And we started with the uh, existing lights on the levy uh, between SoCal and water versus this project is between water and Highway 1 on both sides of the levy. And, um, as part of that process in working at the International Dark Sky, um, the local chapter, you know, we made some modifications and we made further modifications after we took it to the commission and after we had that discussion. So we've included a different light um, that is um, one that actually has been used on Mission Street for decorative lighting, it had um, some very positive reviews from um, International Dark Sky. And it's a recessed light. It has a deep skirt, uh, focuses the light more linearly along the path versus the older one that we were going to use. Um, it has, uh, we call a bug rating that is consistent with patients. It's a, a one, zero, one, which, let me just think exactly what that was. I had my note here to remind me. Oh, so one is backlight. There's very little backlight. A zero is for the uplight. So there's no uplight. It's essentially all focused down. And then a one for glare. So the glare is also very limited. Um, when the modeling was done, it showed that there was a little spillover into the river, if any, uh, down to the creek part. There's a little bit down the side of the uh, levee slope. Uh, but really is um, the best light that we could find. Now, the, the heat temperature of the light, originally they had recommended 2,700. We've gone down from 4,000 to 3,000, so we're very close. Uh, going below 3,000, we're concerned that the light or, or the color rendition uh, isn't very good as you go further down in the heat. Lamb, air, uh, uh, heat temperature, and and that's important for uh, security, 
uh, for people to recognize what's in front of them, as well as for police in case or emergency services in, in case they need to identify that uh, might be in trouble, et cetera, that they get the colors correct. And so that's why we're going with the 3,000 versus the 2,700 or lower. So we've made all these changes to the project. They've been incorporated in the plans and the specifications. And uh, our intention is to go out to bid as soon as um, the council approves the project. Uh, the project's 100% grant funded through the active transportation program. And um, time we get uh, advertised and awarded, we're looking at probably construction starting approximately November and depending on the supply chain issues with getting streetlights, um, you know, that could happen pretty quickly or it could be delayed depending on uh, where we are with, uh, with the contractor ordering the lights. But November through December, potentially, maybe a little bit later. Thank you so much for that overview and all of your work. This is really, you know, I think this is just an, a great example of, you know, how um, you know, consulting with uh, community folks and, and people who really spend a lot of time thinking about these matters um, can really improve uh, a project. And so I just really appreciate um, all your work to, to bring this forward. And with that, I would go ahead and, and move that um, we approve the plans and specifications for the San Lorenzo River Walk lighting project as recommended by staff. Um, and we have the language in our agenda packet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead. Okay. Um, Mayor, this, this, is on, this, hasn't been, this hasn't been pulled anyway. It's still part of consent. So yeah, you guys. Exactly. Yeah, this was a. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. This is the question. Yeah. <laughs> Second I, I, time I, I, on the consent agenda. I'm so sorry. I, I, I'm, I'm absolutely going to support it. And thank you for, for everything you, you've done. Yeah, I caught that. Um, okay, we have one item pulled. We'll come back to that. But now I'm going to take um, our consent um, items. Um, so this will be items uh, 13 through 24 on our agenda with the exception of item number 23. And I'll go ahead and take this out to public comment. Okay, for those who would like to um, comment on our Consent agenda items 13 through 24, with the exception of 23. Now is the time for you to call in. Instructions will be on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device, press star nine to raise your hand and listen for the cue saying that you have been unmuted. All items, uh, excuse me. So we'll go ahead. Uh, I see phone number ending in 0030. Press star nine, you'll, star nine, you'll be unmuted. There you go. Good afternoon, uh, this is uh, Rob Sonnenfeld. Uh, thank you, Council, for uh, uh, your leadership. Um, I'm uh, speaking this afternoon uh, regarding um, the consent agenda item number 18. Uh, this has to do with exploring the uh, impacted parking situation in the Beach Flats neighborhood. And um, while I think it's important uh, to uh, to explore solutions to this problem. Um, I'm concerned that the language in this uh, consent uh, agenda item is uh, prescriptive uh, in that it, it focuses on uh, reducing costs specifically for uh, for the Nueva Vista, Vista residents who uh, are uh, living in a 48-unit uh, affordable housing complex that has 48 off-street parking spots. Uh, uh, Beach Flats overall has somewhere around 400 homes, and uh, the majority of those homes do not have any off-street parking. And uh, uh, additionally, uh, over 75% of the neighborhood is uh, rent burdened with the average, uh, 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 average household paying uh, upwards of 70% of their income on rent. Uh, it's uh, concerning if the approach to uh, uh, looking at the parking situation uh, could be in inequitably uh, uh, giving additional uh, street parking to uh, 
who already have access to off-street parking uh, to the uh, uh, detriment of the other residents in, in the neighborhood who don't have access to off-street parking. Um, so I just encourage uh, you all to uh, uh, review this item and to uh, 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 change the, uh, the framework to uh, trying to resolve the, uh, uh, the parking, the impacted parking impact and not prescribing uh, reducing costs because costs may be, uh, uh, lowering costs may actually be counterproductive in, uh, in resolving the situation. Thank you. Next, I have caller with the phone number ending in 0581. Press star nine to unmute. Star six. Yeah, hello. Sorry. Um, Press star six to unmute. Sorry about that. 0581, there you go, you're unmuted. Go ahead, please. Hi. Okay, uh, I wanted to um, address the, the issue about the write out. Was that it, item number 23? No, that item is not on our agenda today. So if you wanted to talk about that, you would have to come back at oral communications later on this afternoon after item number okay. 27 on our agenda. Um, and, oh, about what time might that be? Do you know? Bonnie, did you have a comment? No. Yeah. Oh. Uh, that will likely occur sometime around, uh, let me just look here, sometime around six, let's see here, sometime around five, 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 five probably about five, five thirty today. Okay, great. I, I, I absolutely. Am, It'll be after item 31 on our agenda. I'm sorry, it's 31, and it is very likely it'll be around 5 or 5.15. Thank you. Next up is caller one, uh, ending in 1810. Star 6 to unmute, please. Yeah, this is Gareth Philip. As regards the meeting minutes, I believe you misstated the point of my oral communication speech where I did not speak in opposition to Black Lives Matter. I spoke in opposition to this city's government, that's you, and its lack of judgment sanctioning of a block-long BLM billboard symbol in front of City Hall, as well as promoting the LGBT moral agenda near with a permanent rainbow flag displays on the Pride, or, I mean, Civic Auditorium, because it signals approval for all those movements stand for in the people name. You don't get to pick and choose what organizational symbols mean. You endorse their whole enchilada uh, agenda of beliefs and behaviors when approving their display on public property. As was pointed out, you should not promote extreme Malcolm X-inspired Marxist anarchist mob violence with the goal of the destruction of the entire institution of criminal justice or promoting the LGBT moral agenda, because again, this exceeds government purpose and scope. You see, there is a legality definition like prostitution is illegal, that is within your authority, but outside those definitions, their moralities, such as uh, what might, uh, what some might judge as perhaps unrepentant, whorish promiscuity, are for the court of public opinion and an individual's internal moral compass to decide, not you, not you, in government to promote personal, extreme, controversial political agendas or morals at will, using public property as propaganda. For clarity as to what I said last meeting, you should have stuck to of what happened to George Floyd and, and uh, started all that violence. Uh, you did that with some police reform, but then you went straight back to authority abuse with the unconstitutional discriminatory report ordinance and the BLM billboard. One important lesson of George Floyd was he was not a victim of systemic racism because that never came up in the Chauvin trial because it didn't exist, so it is that George Floyd's death had nothing to do with his race. The bigger lesson is that even a kind of low-life drug addict like George Floyd, and we got plenty of those here, has a life as precious as anyone's, and the government had best respect the lives of all its citizens. Not abusing authority, then, is the big lesson that is the government's to learn. Thanks. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other hands uh, raised in uh, concerning the uh, consent agenda, so I'm now looking for a motion on items number 13 through 24, exception of item 23. Councilmember Brown. I'll, uh, now that the time has come, I will uh, move the consent agenda with the exception of item 23. 
Thank you. And Council Member Watkins. I'll second that. Okay. Great. Okay. So we have by Council Member Brown, seconded by Council Member Watkins to approve the consent agenda items number 13 through 24 with the exception of 23. I'd like to ask the clerk to please call a roll vote. Council Member Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Oh, both she stepped out. Vice Mayor Brunner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. We'll now go back to item number 23, which for the public is the item cost of construction fee revision. This is what from our public works department and um, I'll have Chris Schneider. Uh, this was pulled by Council Member Cummings and Vice Mayor Brunner. Thank you, Mayor. I had a couple of questions come in from members of the public. Um, so one of the, the first question is they were wondering how the city can allocate more um, funding to the active transportation as part of the fee. And I think it's it sounds like by ordinance, 15% uh, um, of this fee actually goes towards active transportation. And so um, they were just wanting to get some clarity on that. And I got these uh, like this morning. So um, sorry I wasn't able to ask these questions and bring these forward to um, see if we can find some answers for these members of the public. I'm sure Chris Schneider, Assistant Director of Public Works. So the traffic impact fee program when it was established um, 10 years or more ago um, included um, a percentage on top of traffic impact fee uh, for alternative transportation, that was 15%. And then, um, but also every project that's in the traffic impact fee program also includes pedestrian and bicycle improvements. So at an intersection or green lanes, et cetera, those are often included in the project. So the reality is the program contributes to each project or contributes about 40% it's active transportation. Um, the, the traffic impact fee program is based on measuring impacts and the impacts are related to motor vehicles, not to bikes and pedestrians. And so therefore that fee that we've, the 15% we've added on to the program is an add on. So if you wanna add an additional percentage or increase, you'd have to add that on top of what's being proposed already. And, um, you know, in the past, we've had some discussion about, you know, how that would be acceptable to the development community as they pay these fees that they're, you know, paying above and beyond what the impacts are to their development. Uh, at the time, the 15% was deemed, um, you know, acceptable as part of the community process done years ago to approve uh, the traffic impact fee program. I'm not sure what, how that would um, go now, um, but um, it's more of a policy uh, decision than what's before you now. What we're talking about right now is really more administrative changes, an increase in the traffic impact fee due to the cost of construction, uh, having increased 50 the last 10 years, um, and more, even more recently, uh, we haven't raised the rate uh, since uh, 2012. And uh, incorporating um, the downtown amendments that were approved in 2017 into the program, so it's more equitable how those fees uh, or traffic impacts are paid for overall development. And then also uh, changing our tr transportation study uh, guidelines to requirements, and that's uh, related to making them more consistent across all development. Um, so again, that's, you know, that adding on is more really a policy decision than the decision of whether it's gonna, you know, need to go back for further discussion or not. Great, thanks for that clarification. And then the other question, um, in the resolution, uh, one of the whereas is mentions that um, CEQA 
guidelines that were revised on June 9, 2020 to comply with Senate Bill 743 to use vehicle miles traveled as a measure of significance in analyzing uh, transportation impact. Has that been the model that we've been using or have we started transitioning to that model in terms of um, calculating um, uh, traffic impacts? And if we are moving in that direction, I guess, you know, if, have we gotten there yet or are we still kind of trying to work through that, those calculations? So um, that legislation made vehicle miles travel the CEQA uh, analysis for whether there are traffic impacts or not. The city of Santa Cruz is a built out community and we're, because we have green belts that control that we're doing really um, internal development versus external. Very few projects will show up with a VMT uh, impact, if any. And so far, we've been applying the VMT standard and we haven't seen any impacts. Uh, or or the, the modeling for the VMT doesn't reflect any impacts. In discussing using VMT, VMT impacts for traffic, for developing fee impact, you know, the fees based on impacts essentially would decimate the traffic impact fee program. Um, that legislation still allows using level of service this for fees, for transportation impact fees. Mm -hmm. And that's why we still have that program. And that's why most communities still have it that way. Um, in discussing uh, a, a VMT-based fee with uh, consultants, there are some communities that are making an effort to go there, but it, it's unclear how successful they are and uh, whether it really is solving uh, the problems they've set out to do. So I think in the future, there'll be more information on that, but right now it's not really something that uh, we can use um, in the program. Great, thanks Chris. Mm -hmm. Vice Mayor Bruder, did you have questions on this item? Uh, my question was related since this item uh, we received correspondence from a member of the public and regarding this item going to the Transportation Commission for recommendation. And I just wanted to ask about that process. And um, since it's seeking a fee, a change to the fees. Sure, and this again is uh, more of just administrative changes to the program consistent with uh, what we've done before. For policy, if there was a, a policy change, then we take it back to the commission for review uh, before we come to the council. But at this point, it's just looking at the fee uh, and increasing the fee as a result of um, these two things, adding the downtown amendment projects and um, a cost of construction increase. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chris. Um, I would look for a motion then for item number 23 on the consent agenda, which is the cost of construction fee. Mayor, revision. you need public comment. Oh, that's right. Thank you. I will take out item number 23 from our consent agenda for public comment. Is there anyone in the uh, in attendees today that would like to comment on item 23 of our consent agenda? Please press star now, star nine to raise your hand and then listen for the cue saying you've been unmuted. I do see caller uh, ending in number last four digit 0030. So this will be just for item 23, which is the cost of construction fee revision item. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon. This is Robert Sonnen Sullivan. Uh, thanks so much for uh, pulling this item. Um, I just wanted to uh, uh, emphasize that that uh, you know it is concerning that our uh, our fee is is based on level of service and uh, and you know while you know forty percent of of the uh, funding for that could be going towards uh, uh, transportation uh, that's not a a requirement and. Um, uh, I would hope that this council, if you're going to approve uh, uh, this fee increase, that uh, you 
really in the future um, or maybe even in a motion today look at at, uh, at um, tying that to uh, investments in um, alternative modes of transportation besides uh, driving. As we all know, uh, you know, as we make improvements to uh, streets like adding lanes, uh, we induce demand for, for vehicles and uh, we basically eventually really never get anywhere. So we are potentially spending money on on uh, uh, making fixes to uh, uh, improve our transportation that are very short term that, that are, are not going to actually result in an improved level of service over the long term. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public that would like to uh, speak to item number uh, 23 on the consent agenda? I see Kyle Kel Kelly, go ahead, please. Hey, thank you so much, Council, uh, for, for presenting on this item. Um, I, I do want to see us take, take a glance at what's going to be the right way to handle this for our climate action plan. If we continue to do level of service, we are continuing with car-based infrastructure and prizing car-based infrastructure, and at some point, on how to switch it, and it is in the general plan right now for why it's level of service, not DMT. Um, and this will probably sound strange to some of you since I come and speak in, front, in favor of doing housing, but I would actually like to see the fee raised um, so that we could put more money into active transportation because we're, we're capped. I see it on the commission, um, you know, for, for how much we have allocated for our action. Um, I, I want to get us out of out of cars as soon as possible. Maybe there's nothing to do today, but I at least I, I'm I'm glad that we've opened this conversation up. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I will bring it back to council uh, for uh, a motion. Council Member Walker. Happy to move item number three. Okay, and Council Member Brown. Uh, so I will second that, but I wanted to, excuse me, ask a question about the um, the possibility of, of sending this to the Transportation and Public Works Commission. Um, you know, I, I support the increase. I think it makes sense to uh, try to better reflect the actual costs there. Um, and I don't wanna delay that, but I also uh, agree that the Transportation and Public Works Commission does um, play uh, a major role or, or they're, they're established to play a role in um, these kinds of conversations. And um, so I'm just wondering if the make motion would be willing to include um, that with that approval that we would send uh, the, the issue of traffic impact fees for review and any additional recommendations to the Transportation and Public Works Commission uh, for discussion and, and possible recommendation to the, to the council uh, in the future. I, I'm um, before, I'm interested in having those go at just wondering in terms of the action before us today, um, in regards to having that go back to that commission then, and then back, what, Chris, or, do you wanna to speak to that or in terms of process? Um, sure, um, you know, we have had uh, discussions with individual uh, members of the commission on the traffic impact fee program. We do know that they're interested in increasing um, the percentage for alternative transportation, um, you know, would have to be in context with all the other increases in alternative transportation. I mean, if you look at our capital improvement program and all the transportation grants we've been receiving, they're all for active transportation. Uh, you know, we just received almost a 10 million grant for segment seven, phase two of the rail trail. Um, the active transportation, you know, is paying for the lighting on the levy, um, and there's a number of other projects like that. And we continue to also use other funding. Measure D um, has been applied to a number of projects. 
uh, SB1, which is a gas tax increase. That's been paying for some of the enhanced bike striping and uh, access rent for um, the uh, paving projects, et cetera. So, you know, if, if we can bring the whole thing back, the whole funding scope of how things, how active transportation is paid for, I think they'll see that there's a lot more out there than has been in past years. And um, um, taking, uh, risking this program in order to try to get more may not be advantageous for the city and maybe isn't as critical as people think right now. So anyway, I think it's important to prove the action now. The commission will have another opportunity to put this on their agenda in the future. Okay. I'm more comfortable with as the motion, and then I don't know if Councilor Brown, that's sort of the second part of your um, friendly amendment, if you will, to have these you know, forthcoming as discussions for the commission, if that feels okay for you. That, that was actually what I, I was, sorry if that wasn't clear. Um, I'm having an issue with clarity today for some reason. Um, that, the, that we would approve this today and then um, refer the the overall issue that it, it appears that at least some members of the Transportation and Public Works Commission are interested in having a conversation at the commission level. So the, the addition is really to suggest that in addition to adopting the resolution, you know, as stated here in the staff recommendation to um, refer, to ask and Public Works Commission to uh, review uh, traffic impact fees and other um, uh, so in the context of alternative transportation funding and make recommendations as they see fit. So this is, this is, is in addition to what the yeah. staff recommendation today. The reason that I'm, I am suggesting this is because um, you know, I, I think I heard you say, uh, Chris, that you, there will be other opportunities for the Transportation and Public Works Commission to, to look at this. And I just want to make sure that happens. And I know that they don't necessarily have the ability to set their agenda in the same way that um, the council does. So um, I'm just wanting to make sure that there's space for that or that the council would, or to see if, the, if council members would support the Transportation and Public Works Commission having an agenda item like that and possibly making additional recommendations to us for the future. So that was my intention. I'm just gonna ask Tony. Um, Tony, I, is, this, is this a little I outside like, the realm of the item as it's agendized? I, I feel like, first of all, I feel like the second part of the motion needs, needs to be clarified because it was kind of a, conversation than a motion. Um, I saw what was on the screen as a, you know, as a motion. And I, I think that the council could direct that an item be uh, sent to the Transportation and Public Works Commission for further analysis, but I just think it needs to be clear what uh, specific direction that is. What I heard from you, Chris, and what I think I'm hearing from you also, um, Councilor Brown, is that, um, we can go ahead and move forward with the action before us today, but in the future, uh, within a broader context of um, other sort of alternatives to transportation, um, that we could have the commission that um, sort of the holistic approach and, and kind of weigh in at that at that level. Um, but I but I I don't want to direct something that doesn't feel clearer or or um, necessary or appropriate as as related to this item also. Yeah, and, and there has been some discussion uh, when we take the capital improvement program uh, to the, the commissions every year, um, not only for their recommendations uh, prior to council adoption of the budget, but also uh, when we do updates uh, to the commission. So there has been some opportunity for that. And at some time, depending on staff resources. I can't commit to it because I'm gonna be gone pretty soon, uh, but uh, somebody will be working on this program and uh, they will, uh, can, you know, have, there's always that potential to have it scheduled for the commission as a individual item. It's definitely doable. Great. Um, maybe just, maybe given the, um, 
the kind of overall um, sentiment of the council and kind of seeing this move forward in some way as appropriate. I don't know if it necessarily needs to be part of the motion, but just in general, kind of wanting to see that engagement. I wonder if that works for the council at this time. And I'll say that staff has heard you. Okay, great. Great. <laughs> That's great. Thanks. Okay. Um, we will. Um, so the motion stands um, to um, uh, approve agenda item 23, which is cost of construction fee revision. There is a motion by council member Hawkins, second by council member Brown. And I'd like to go ahead and ask for a roll call vote. Council member Watkins. Aye. Calentari Johnson. Aye. <clears throat> Brown. Aye. Boulder is absent. Um, Cummings? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Okay, next up, is, next up is our consent public hearing. These are items uh, 25 and 26 on our agenda. For the public who are streaming this meeting, if you want to comment on items 25 or 26, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. This is item number 25 and 26. And for the public, number 25 is the second reading and final adoption of ordinance number 21. 2021-15 Municipal Code Amendments relating to ADU units responding to modifications requested by the Coastal Commission. And item number 26 is the second reading and final adoption of ordinance number 20-16 amending chapter 13.04.011 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code related to London Nelson Community Center. Uh, are there any council members who wish to pull an item from the um, consent public hearing item or consent public hearing today? I am not seeing any. Um, go ahead and take this out um, to um, the public uh, for comments. If there are any members of the public that would like to speak to any consent public hearing item, now is the time to do so. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two, two minutes. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak? I'm not seeing any hands. So I will bring it back to the council for a motion. Council member Cummings. I'll move the um, consent public hearing items 25 and 26. And council member Watkins, I'll second that. We have a motion to approve uh, our consent public hearing items number 25 and 26. Motion by council member Cummings, seconded by council member Watkins. I'd like to ask for the clerk for a roll call vote, please. Council member Watkins? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Councilmember Boulder still gone. Vice Mayor Bruner had to step away. Um, Mayor Myers. Aye. That motion passes un unanimously. Uh, item number 27 on our um, agenda today has been continued to a special meeting scheduled for Tuesday, August 31st, 2021 at 4.30 p.m. That item will not be discussed today. I'm going to uh, adjourn for about 10 minutes and we will reconvene at 3.15 just to give council members a brief uh, break to uh, get up and stretch. So um, for those members in the public, we will be coming back on item number 28, which is introduced for publication and ordinance and then in chapter 13.40 of the municipal code related to parks and recreation departments that adopt a park program. So we'll be back at 3.15 uh, to go ahead and do that item. Thanks, everybody. Two, three, four. Okay. <clears throat> okay.
Okay, we'll go ahead and get started um, for the public. We are now on item number 28 on our agenda, and that is to introduce for publication an ordinance amending chapter 13.40 of the Municipal Code related to the Parks and Recreation Department's Adopt a Park program. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wanna comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Uh, so I'll go ahead and call up um, Tony Elliott, our Director of Parks and Recreation, and this is for item number 20, introduced for publication and ordinance amending chapter 13.40 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code related to park adoption. All right, thank you, Mayor. Uh, for the record, Tony Elliott, Parks and Recreation Director. Um, and I will share my screen for a short presentation here. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. All right, great, thank you. Well, it's um, nice to talk about this today on a day that we were uh, able to recognize council members for your volunteerism uh, out at Main Beach. So just quickly, thank you again uh, for everybody's participation. Uh, on this topic of volunteerism, um, we have a proposal uh, for the city council today, uh, which is a request to consider proposed amendments to the Santa Cruz Municipal Code Chapter 13.40. Uh, regarding the Parks and Rec Department's adopt a park program. Um, so the, I'll, I'll just move through this pretty quickly here, but just a little bit of background to, to start. So the adopt a park program was developed in 2017 um, to create a program that allows community groups, uh, schools, organizations, and individuals to partner with the Parks and Recreation Department uh, on the installation or maintenance of parks, park amenities, landscaping, and facilities at city parks or areas of responsibility by the Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, currently, the department has uh, eight park adoption agreements or eight park adopters, and we have an additional three that are pending. Uh, these groups work on activities ranging from pulling weeds to laying down mulch, um, uh, to maintaining trails and planting native plants. So just to, to name a couple examples. Um, and adoptive park activities take place throughout the city park system um, at a range of spaces. Uh, and just to name a few, the San Lorenzo River Levee, um, the Riverwalk area, Grant Park, uh, De La Viega Trails, uh, Pilkington Creek um, over on the east side, uh, and many, uh, many others. So I just wanna cover um, quickly what the program does, what the adopt park program does and what it does not do. And so this won't be fully comprehensive, but just a bit of a snapshot um, in terms of what the program uh, does. So in the context of the adopt park program, um, all work done by volunteers must be in line with work that the department would do. Uh, and that work is in accordance with master plans with um, various um, uh, plans and procedures, policies, not the least of which are different site-specific resource management plans, park-specific management plans, uh, for example. So all work has to be really what department staff would do and no more. Uh, adds capacity to the Parks and Recreation Department and allows a meaningful way for residents to get involved in Parks and Rec. Um, all of our adoptive park agreements begin with a work plan. Uh, so before any group gets started, we develop a work plan so that staff and volunteers can develop clear goals um, and ensure that volunteers have the capacity uh, and the skills and the commitment needed uh, to become a park adopter. Uh, quickly, I just wanna cover what the program doesn't do. Um, and this was kind of a topic of discussion at our Parks and Rec Commission uh, meeting on this topic. Um, the program does not give any unique authority to volunteer groups, and it does not provide any sort of autonomy uh, to groups uh, just to take action as they see fit. Uh, so I think that, again, that's important. The work that is done has to be based on an agreed upon work plan and does not give anybody any spe specific benefits um, in terms of doing what work they want to do uh, specifically. Um, the program is structured so that all park adopters enter into an agreement with Parks and Rec 
uh, based on the work plan uh, that I mentioned, and again, in accordance with master plan, uh, different master plans and management plans. And finally, the program does not grant exclusivity, so multiple groups can volunteer along the river walk, for example. So this would not give rights to one group just simply to take over or adopt uh, the entire river, for example. You could have multiple groups. Those amendments before the City Council today uh, include removing language related to donations and or sponsorships as a qualifier for park adoptions. Uh, both the department and the city have separate donations and sponsorship policies for these purposes. Um, in the council's packet, I shared some examples of uh, really robust sponsorship programs that we are looking to develop uh, something similar. So rather than have complete sponsorship or donation language in the adopt a park uh, code, we want to really separate that. And that'll be something that we bring back uh, in the future in terms of uh, potential sponsorship policy. Um, the other proposed amendment is related to the approval of our adopt park agreement. So the current language is not necessarily clear, but has been interpreted to give the commission, the Parks and Recreation Commission, the review and approve uh, park adoption agreements. So the proposal before council is to amend the language to clarify that approval authority reside with the department. And the purpose of this is to ensure that the adopt a park program is effectively administered, but also efficient in our process. So when volunteers are interested, we want to engage them um, in an efficient way to keep them interested and, and get them engaged. Uh, we do see um, uh, a lot of instances of what we often re uh, refer to as vigilante volunteerism <laughs> throughout the park system. Um, and so in our efforts to make the adopt a park program, our, our effort really is to make the adopt a park program very approachable and very streamlined for prospective volunteers and therefore hoping to avoid some of that sort of rogue volunteerism that we often see, which a lot of times is not in line with master plans or management plans uh, throughout the city. So staff uh, will recommend that the ordinance language be amended so that adopt a park agreements may be approved administratively uh, within the department. Uh, the Parks and Rec Commission voted four to three to support these changes. The primary concerns among the commission members who voted against uh, the changes included fears about the autonomy of some of the groups and the lack of over and potential lack of oversight. Uh, they worried about a lack of expertise among volunteers uh, and the need for clear criteria upon which volunteers are evaluated in order to become and remain part. So in response to a lot of these concerns, staff updated the associated uh, administrative procedure order, the APO, which is included with your packet to include a few things. It, we included a lot more detailed criteria for park adoption agreements. Um, we also amended the initial term of all adopt a park agreements to six months so that we could effectively evaluate the work product after six months rather than giving groups a full year to start. So if they're approved after that six months, uh, we could extend that from one year um, or, or more. Um, additionally, staff created a, uh, an appeals process in the ordinance language so that uh, volunteers who are denied or who may be denied being a park adopter uh, by the department, they can appeal to the Parks and Recreation Commission. So we wanted to hear these concerns from the commission, um, again, clarify that, um, again, this does not grant groups exclusivity or any uh, unique authority or autonomy so we wanted to clarify that. And again, we, we modified the associated APO um, that goes with this ordinance, those criteria, both for approvals, but criteria upon which uh, we could use uh, to potentially deny applications. Um, and the commission could use those same criteria uh, to evaluate uh, any denials uh, that come before them in the form of an appeal. So finally, um, as currently established by the APO, uh, staff will continue to provide an annual report to the Parks and Recreation Commission on the adopt a park program. Uh, and so today, staff recommends that the City Council uh, hold first reading on the amended changes, uh, but we're happy to answer any questions that you may have uh, in the meantime. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Tony, for that report. Um, I will go ahead and open this up for uh, questions um, from city council at this time. Sorry, I'm managing my barking dog here real quick here. Uh, uh, council member Brown. Um, thank you, Tony, for the report and for working on this uh, this um, process here. I, and the procedures have been um, interesting to navigate and having been involved in one of these situations where there's a little bit of rogue activity happening and we're trying to actually um, make that more um, collaborative with the city and, um, you know, really, really um, track with the, the specific goals for that um, that riparian area. I'm I'm really glad to see this happening. Um, I I know that the the commissioners did have some concerns, and so I've um, I've heard from a couple of folks about this, and I just wanted to ask the question for, so we can maybe hear from you about how you are anticipating um, recognizing that there's an appeals process for folks who want to adopt a park and, and may not get approved. Um, how and that nobody has, um, you know, sole ownership over sites, um, how you see um, kind of navigating any potential um, differences, community differences with, you know, there's, there's obviously even within the parameters that we have some interpretation and, um, you know, so there's gray areas and there may be conflicts and, um, I'm just wondering how you're thinking about approaching that. Would those also be directed to the commission or like if it gets trickier, um, would it go to the commission or, or what are you thinking about how to, how to approach it? should it arise? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think it really starts um, to the best of our ability in sort of an upstream way. So when we uh, enter into our work plans with volunteer groups, we wanna make sure it's really clear from the front end um, and so I think any sort of discrepancy, you know, whether it's um, in a certain area, should we plant only natives? Should we plant, uh, you know, a variety of other plants? How should it be maintained? We do see those uh, disagreements or different interpretations pretty frequently. But what we can do, again, on the front end of any of these is make sure that in those work plans, how we are guiding any adopters is consistent uh, so that the expectation is really the same from the front end. Now, if that work plan, again, if a group deviates from that work plan, then we're gonna have to have conversations with that group because we've gotta stay in alignment with that. And that would reflect different uh, resource management plans and, and so forth. Um, but yeah, certainly, um, you know, where we have parks or properties that are a little more uh, open to interpretation on how they should be maintained. Um, again, I think it would really start with the work plan internally um, and again, evaluating a group's capacity, but just setting those expectations up front. And I think if we did have um, conflicts that arise for some reason, I think we would first try to uh, address that internally um, as part of our process, but we absolutely would engage the commission in that process, most likely through the context of our annual report to say, We're, we found a problem or we found some issue that, that's coming up. And so maybe we need, do we need to modify our APO or make adjustments from there? So that's that reporting back to them so they can have that oversight of how is this working, what are the outcomes, um, and you know, what and what's our engagement? Are we are we involving more groups as well? Great. Thank you. I just have one one quick follow-up to that. Um, I, I really appreciate it. Um, just to, and I don't want to volunteer her, but we, you do have one commissioner who is particularly uh, skilled and knowledgeable at, around, you know, native vegetation and um, Jane Mio, who many of you know um, through her own work, and and so um, and she was really helpful to me and you know to our group in uh, you know doing a, a bit of a review of what we were looking at and what what existed. Um, so. I don't want to volunteer her, but I, I would say that she's an amazing resource. And um, if there's a way to, you know, as people kind of trying to um, make these proposals, if it seems appropriate to 
you know, get them access to that expertise. If, um, and so I'm just, you know, I, I don't know that that would be a formal thing, but just, just really wanting to, to um, recognize her, um, the role that she played, critical role that she's played, and the really helpful role um, for, uh, you know, at least in my experience, and certainly on the on the river, the San Lorenzo River. So, um, if there's a way to kind of use that resource too, and your, it might help you as well um, with your, um, you know. I know you're understaffed and, and always overburdened. So um, anyway, just, just a thought. And uh, I know that it's um, it's a work in progress and absolutely want to support you as you move forward. Yeah, just to briefly uh, follow up on that. Yeah, uh, Jane, uh, who's our uh, Parks and Recreation Commission chair and also uh, a volunteer lead for many different groups. I'm not sure how she does it all, but she is an incredible resource uh, and somebody that we look to a lot. In fact, if I just quickly may uh, offer a shameless plug for Jane, Jane is working down at the Benchlands right now, um, not today specifically, but working with a group uh, down there uh, on stewardship along the, the river uh, in the Benchlands. So working with individuals uh, living down on the Benchlands right now. And so that's kind of an extension of the Downtown Streets Team Stewardship Program. But we are absolutely, um, um, you know, squeezing everything out of Jane as we can because she's a great, a great leader, and we appreciate her skills. And she's uh, proven to be a, a great leader. And she, she has a, uh, at least one outstanding uh, park adoption um, uh, proposal or, or agreement with us that she's eager to get moving forward. So we're hopeful that uh, with these amendments that we can get her on board and uh, and doing some pretty great stuff. Thanks. Are there any question, other questions from council members at this point? Okay, I'll go ahead and take it out as public comment then. If you're interested in commenting on item number 28 on today's agenda, that's an ordinance amending the municipal code related to the Parks and Recreation Department's Adopt a Park program, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand at this time. When it is your time to speak, we'll hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. I'm looking at our attendees and I'm not seeing anyone here. So I'll go ahead and bring this back to council for either further questions or would look to a uh, motion at this time. Council member Kontari Johnson and council member Watkins. Thank you, Tony and team for bringing this. I would um, like to make a motion to approve staff's recommendation. Do I need to read? No, we're good on that. Um, and council member Watkins. I'll go ahead and second that motion. Okay. We have a motion uh, by council member Kalantari Johnson, seconded by council member uh, Watkins uh, to introduce her publication and ordinance amending chapter 13.40 of the municipal code related to the Parks and Recreation Department's Adopt a Park program. Uh, Bonnie, can we do a roll call vote, please? Mm -hmm. Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Tony. Great you. program. Okay. Next up, we have item number 29 on our agenda, which is the permanent outdoor seating program update and directions. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. I'll go ahead and turn this over to Rebecca Unit, our economic development manager. Welcome, Rebecca. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having us. And uh, I will turn over to Bonnie to give a brief introduction of this item for us. Thanks, Rebecca. And good afternoon, Mayor and members of the council. Um, I just wanted to introduce the item and acknowledge that we have received a fair number of uh, communication from members of the public, impacted businesses, and um, 
um, in reading through the recommendation, um, we realized that particularly um, for what as it relates to private spaces, we are recommending that we extend the temporary period for outdoor seating in private spaces as well for the same time period to the end of December 2022. Um, the nuance that we were trying to communicate and will clarify in the presentation is that additionally, we want to provide some outreach to those spaces in private spaces to clarify and look closely at um, any sort of code requirements for those spaces um, that are a little different in private spaces than when we're looking specifically at parking um, that are in the public spaces. And so one of the challenges that we've had um, in looking at the outdoor seating program um, is that we have our managing of these permits on an emergency temporary basis. And so in looking at a capacity standpoint of how to move forward, we're, we've been trying to categorize to the extent possible those that fit certain, certain criteria. And so by focusing on the public areas, specifically the public spaces, those have set criteria. And so we're able to sort of look at those as a group. When we look at the private spaces, those have different set of criteria that's in the existing code. And so what we want to be able to do in the coming months is one-on-one -on -one sit down with those businesses and be able to give them feedback um, on those spaces and help them sort of facilitate the process for them if they're interested in it during this extended year, uh, it, it basically ordinance period to provide some assistance for them to go through the administrative use process. So I just wanted to clarify that because I think um, we unintentionally um, in the staff report um, did lack some clarity in that area. And when Rebecca uh, follows up with the presentation, you'll see um, the change that we're proposing in the recommendation as it relates to that for private spaces. And with that, I'll turn it over to Rebecca. All right, thank you very much. Um, so today we are presenting an update on our permanent outdoor dining uh, program progress, uh, as well as a request for direction from the city council. So um, our sort of agenda for this presentation is a snapshot of the current temporary outdoor dining program, um, going over some of the outright outreach and feedback uh, that we have received, um, and then covering sort of the two paths to permanence, uh, specifically for parklets on uh, public property, and then also the outdoor dining that we have on private property, um, and then our staff recommendation for your consideration. Uh, giving you a brief overview of sort of the timeline of outdoor dining in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, we, in 1991, uh, the city actually created the sidewalk dining that you see downtown on Pacific Avenue as part of the downtown recovery plan following the earthquake. Um, that was very successful and uh, in as um, parklets became a thing with San Francisco sort of leading the charge in that um, and a lot of our downtown businesses wanting to be able to take advantage of those expansions into on-street parking. We created a pilot um, parklet program and we had two businesses that took advantage of that. That's who was and was below downtown. In 2017, um, the city did formalize that program as part of some of the downtown plan updates, um, but we didn't really take uh, a lot of the steps that we needed to do in making that really feasible for businesses to take advantage of. Um, so we still uh, now in 2021 only have those two businesses operating permanent parklets. Um, and then we came to March 2020 with the uh, pandemic and coronavirus um, shelter in place orders, and we saw a significant uh, interruption to business activity. Um, and in June 2020, uh, the City Council responded to the impacts to businesses and created our uh, temporary outdoor expansion program through the City Manager's uh, executive orders. Um, and that allowed for outdoor dining and retail displays on sidewalks, alleys, street closures, and private property. Um, in December of 2020, we extended this uh, current executive order to October 2021. 20, 20, um, and that was uh, it also was very beneficial when the state enacted the regional stay home order, which shut down businesses again after we had had some reopening happening. Um, in June 2021, uh, just a few months ago, uh, the council again extended our emergency ordinance um, through the end of this year, December 31st, 2021. Um, and now 
in August, just a couple months later, and things have changed again um, with the Delta variant increases and concerns to those impacts of businesses and with the mask mandate now in effect as well. Um, so sort of a timeline of where we're at and how this program has evolved and, and some of the circumstances we've been dealing with. Um, and so I just wanna dig a little bit deeper into some of those pre-pandemic outdoor dining programs just to set the context for sort of how we've been operating currently and where this temp comes into play um, in the future plans for permanent. So pre-pandemic, we have been operating uh, an outdoor extension area program is what it's called in the code. And this is our permanent sidewalk dining. Um, this is allowed citywide, however, a majority of these uh, sidewalk dining licenses and permits are in our downtown. Um, we have 21 of these licenses. Um, so those are all of the uh, sidewalk dining that you see on Pacific Avenue. And then we also have some of these in the Beach Street area. Um, and then as I mentioned, we have our outdoor curb extension areas, which are more commonly referred to as parklets. Um, this was created as a pilot program and there's some um, policy and sort of fee restructuring that we need to do to make this really an accessible program. Um, and then we've also had uh, private property outdoor. And this is done really through the planning and building and safety um, reviews. Uh, and this is, you know, private property, it's allowed citywide as long as it's businesses meet what's required in the code um, and, and the findings for those permits. Um, and so now for our current pandemic outdoor dining program, we have the temporary outdoor expansion. Um, this allows free temporary permits. This is a very, very quick and dirty sort of permit process for businesses to give them that real emergency response need um, that they experienced through the pandemic. Um, as part of this, we're allowing the uh, you know, use of public sidewalks, alleyways, parklets, um, private property dining areas. We've also have the two street closures, and then we have, um, we've also allowed retail service and fitness uses on public and private property to address some of those business closures that impact, um, that were impacted from the pandemic. Um, and then as Bonnie mentioned, we have 96 uh, current permit holders um, as part of the temporary program. Um, so it breaks down to 37 parklets, 34 of these permits are on private property, 13 are on the sidewalk or alleyways, and uh, 12 of those are sort of fitness or retail related. Um, we actually saw a lot of our gyms take advantage of this uh, in response to some of those indoor closures, which was really nice to see. Um, and then just to give you a sort of geographic spread of where we're seeing uh, these permits taking place, uh, a lot of the concentration has really been in the downtown and the significant parklet expansion in the downtown. Um, but we've also seen a lot of private property uses on the east side and the west side of Santa Cruz. Um, and seeing a lot of our restaurants and wineries and breweries being able to expand into their property spaces. Um, and then also just to note, we have 96 permits and we have had five business closures. Um, well, in, you know, any business closure is extremely devastating, but um, I think it also speaks to just the uh, power and impact of this program being able to be a lifeline for businesses and helping them to, um, you know, keep moving forward through all the setbacks. Um, as I mentioned, we have our cast car street closure um, in front of Hula's and Lupolo and Spokesman. Um, and this has been a really well received space and given them a lot of um, greatly needed extra dining area. And then our full block closure um, on the 1100 block. And this is just a new photo for you of some of the uh, expanded platforms and parklets that a lot of the businesses have put together there um, as they're really taking ownership of that space and, and doing some fun things. So I'm just to give you a snapshot of the feedback that we've received um, as we've been planning for permanent outdoor dining. Um, we've been working a lot internally uh, as well as with the business community, um, as well as some of our partners in different uh, jurisdictions around the Bay Area. Um, we've uh, attended a lot of the downtown associations, uh, recovery subcommittee meetings to get feedback from you guys. Um, and then had some one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one conversations with businesses. Um, so first and foremost, I think we feel that both internally and externally, time is of the essence and capacity is extremely limited. So um, we know that our businesses are struggling to hire and retain their staff. Um, we know just with everything in the emergency response that we're doing internally at the city that you know capacity is limited there. Um, 
and also just being able to run a business and then make these decisions that they need to make to be able to make investments or um, follow along with the city processes. We want to be really respectful and mindful of everything that they have on their plate. Um, and then the uh, supply chain impacts, um, we're really seeing this have an effect on all layers of permanent outdoor dining. Um, in our communication with some of our colleagues uh, over the hill and other jurisdictions, you know, that are maybe a little bit further along in this process, um, we're seeing impacts on sourcing materials such as planters and, you know, lumber and all the different elements that you need to make uh, the outdoor dining actually happen. And then we are also experiencing this in terms of the uh, design professionals and contractors and, you know, all the construction pieces of bringing this together as well. Um, all of those professionals are really busy and have long wait lists um, to do the work. So that's challenging on both sides of developing the plans and also getting them built and, and completed. Um, and then as we're experiencing now, the uh, COVID-19 continues to be um, really uncertain and just uh, seeing the increase in the Delta variant and those impact businesses, something that we're continuing to navigate and you know, almost been uh, well, it's been over a year of this program, and so it just changes every month um, what the different dynamics are at play. So with all that in mind, um, and just what we've been doing uh, internally and, and reviewing sort of the current temporary um, parklets that we have out there, we've been working towards some goals for the permanent parklet program. So this is those uh, on-street dining areas and public parking spaces. Um, and really our major goals are creating consistency of design, improving safety and maintenance standards. So um, right now with the very temporary nature of our program, um, businesses have sort of adapted how best they can and with the limited funds that they have. So there's a lot of differences in the types of platforms being used or, or businesses might not even have any sort of wooden platform in the streets. Um, and then uh, differences in terms of like the furniture and um, shade coverings and lighting and different things like that. So um, looking at all of those, trying to find consistency and, and some um, real uh, safety and maintenance standards to address some impacts that we're experiencing. Um, and then also policy related, expanding the areas where parklets are allowed beyond just the side streets in downtown. So currently uh, the way that the uh, sort of pilot parklet program was created any parklets on Pacific Avenue. Um, and we have heard from a lot of those businesses that they do want to uh, keep those. And then um, where we might have heard some uh, complaints from retailers or other businesses next door where they don't want to lose that parking, we're seeing a lot more collaboration and seeing people really embrace sort of the impact that having these parklets on Pacific Avenue. Um, so looking at sort of increasing the geography that we allow parklets. Um, as well as in other parts of the city, so beyond downtown, looking at the Beach Street area or um, the east side and west side where it's appropriate. Um, and then a major piece for the parklets, um, something that we were working to address pre-pandemic um, and then got significantly delayed because of it was revising the ongoing fee structure um, and creating an easier process for approval for these parklets. So, um, the initial fee structure that we had for the parklets was somewhat redundant, and so looking at ways to uh, sort of streamline that and ease it and make it a little bit more affordable for businesses going forward. <laughs> so with all that being said, uh, we have a, a pretty big to-do list on sort of bringing this forward, but um, the approach that we are needing to take for permanent programs is um, revising and finalizing the parklet design guidelines. So, um, you know, that's talking about how many parking spaces can businesses use, what types of materials are allowed for the platforms and lighting and those things. Um, we've learned a lot through the temporary, just seeing the creativity of the businesses and, and then also from what some of our other cities are doing uh, in the Bay Area. And so being a little bit more flexible and making those guidelines um, a little bit easier and, and more beneficial to businesses. Um, revising the fee structure, um, because we want to expand the geography and make those changes to the design guidelines, that is going to require some changes to the municipal code in the downtown plan. So working with planning on that. And then um, also when we're looking at expanding beyond the downtown, um, we really need to connect, conduct a review with public works um, to look at sort of the streets where it makes sense and where it's appropriately safe for parklets to be allowed, um, really taking into consideration sort of the effective speed. So, we currently, a 
allow them on streets 25 miles per hour or less, but we know that, um, which is most of our streets in the city, but we know that a lot of traffic is traveling higher than those speeds, so where it doesn't make sense uh, to most safely cite these parklets. Um, and then finally, um, conducting a review of all the existing temporary parklets that we have with the temporary permits uh, and looking at ways to sort of make modifications and bring them into the transition to the permanent process uh, while this uh, temporary program is in place before the expiration and to help them transition into that. So now on the private property side of things, um, this is all of the uh, outdoor dining that is maybe in a uh, private parking lot for a restaurant or a bar or brewery, winery, those different things. Uh, this is anything that's not in the public realm. Um, we actually, the city code currently allows for outdoor seating on private property. Um, that's done through the administrative use permit process uh, for the use approval. Um, and I should also mention that uh, the construction of any outdoor dining would have to go through the building permit process as well. Um, public proper, uh, private property, excuse me, is uh, really dictated by the requirements in the zoning code and uh, the building code uh, for safety and, and construction of those spaces. Um, that permit process takes a look at parking reductions, uh, parking, sorry, parking requirements and any reductions that can be made. Uh, it looks at noise, hours of operation, circulation within the private property space. Um, and then often it provides conditions of approval for operation of those outdoor seating areas to mitigate any potential uh, negative impacts. Um, because we already have this process in place and the planning department is, uh, you know, has this readily available and is able to um, work with these businesses, we're proposing that um, with the path to permanence for private property um, operators is uh, to work with them one-on-one, -on -one, uh, take a look at their current setup, uh, review it with the planning department to, um, you know, determine how it aligns with the current code requirements um, and any, any required changes have to come about based on sort of what the code says. Um, we also, while we're doing this, you know, this is a time for us to really say like, okay, how does the current code match up with what these businesses are doing temporarily? And are there maybe some improvements that could be made? Um, so keeping track of that and really getting that hard data of like, here's how many parking spaces these businesses are using and here's what the code allows and, and keeping a track and, and collecting that data. Um, to see if there's potential policy impacts or recommendations that we could make um, from what we're seeing. And then um, really providing that support to businesses as they apply through the AUP process, uh, making sure that they're understanding um, what the process is and, and guiding them through that. Uh, so with those two uh, major tracks in terms of uh, public parklets, property uh, work that we need to do, this is sort of our proposed timeline and next steps. Um, so as part of our recommendation, we are uh, requesting to extend uh, the emergency ordinance for another year to give businesses the time, to give us the time to fully develop those parklet um, guidelines and, and make the code changes, and then um, also allow the businesses time to get through the permit process. Um, so we're proposing to revise the emergency ordinance and bring that back to the council on the September 28th meeting. Um, and then we would be working with the businesses um, to review the existing temporary parklets for any modifications uh, between September and November, um, and then hoping to finalize the parklet design guidelines uh, by November. And um, we need to coordinate with planning uh, to discuss the timeline for changes in municipal code revisions, um, and then begin permitting for a transition to the permit program in 2022. Um, and then on the private property side, revising the emergency ordinance, uh, doing that review of those existing private property expansions in the same time frame as the parklets, uh, September to November, and then uh, the goal of beginning to uh, transition those permanent in November 2021, because we already have that in place. Um, and so just working with those businesses as quickly as we can to get them the permanency that they're seeking. Um, Councilmember Cummings, did you have a question on? Yes. No, I'll wait till you're done. Okay, great, thank you. So um, that brings us to our recommendations. Um, I know these are pretty extensive recommendations here, um, but our first one is to uh, direct staff to bring back on September 28th, a revised
revised temporary outdoor expansion program emergency ordinance that extends the temporary period for outdoor seating in public spaces, um, which is currently set to expire at the end of this December um, and bringing that through to December 31st, 2022. Um, and then additionally, extending the temporary period for outdoor seating in the private spaces um, through to December 31st, 2022. Um, and we also added on here and provide assistance to those businesses meeting certain criteria in the municipal code to be eligible for permanent approval. So that's that one-on-one -on -one, uh, coordination and support in moving those uh, private property permit holders into the permanent process. Our second recommendation is to work with businesses operating these spaces to make any necessary changes needed to address maintenance issues and help aid transition to the permanent program prior to expiration of the emergency ordinance. And our final uh, recommendation, or actually I shouldn't say that, <laughs> yeah, there's another suggestion there, um, excuse me, uh, direct staff to uh, start working on the necessary revisions to the municipal code for future council consideration or to expand outdoor seating and public on-street parking uh, parklets citywide, including finalizing the revisions to the parklet design guidelines, including pro approved platform designs and materials, safety features, accessibility requirements, and lighting and shade materials. Uh, as well as revi revising the fee structure for parklets and evaluating the potential to waive, modify, or offset fees for one to two years to facilitate pandemic business free. And then we added a fourth one for you <laughs> here for consideration. Um, we wanted to address some of the street closures because uh, we didn't go into too much detail on that in our staff report, um, but it's something that we have been discussing with the business owner. So um, the 1100 block full closure, we have had um, a lot of communication with uh, the downtown association, businesses operating on that block. Um, and then we've also heard uh, feedback from that live in that area about some of the impacts to the access. And um, there's just some interest in reopening that, um, but then also a lot of interest in keeping that space closed and being able to use it for um, special events ongoing. So we want to continue to explore our options there for that block. Um, and uh, planning to bring back a recommendation at the September 28th meeting for uh, sort of the ongoing um, use of that block closure. Um, and then with the cast cart uh, partial closure, we are recommending extending that through December 31st, 2022, uh, along with the other um, extensions that we're granting, uh, just because that block has been very well received and those um, are really benefiting from that, and we want to continue to support uh, that use in that area. Um, those are our recommendations. I would welcome any questions at this time. Thanks, Rebecca. That's a really good uh, presentation. Um, uh, Council Member Cummings? Thanks for that presentation, and I do just want to thank all over in economic development for all the hard work you've been doing trying to make these outdoor dining opportunities happen. Um, it's something that's, as Rebecca, as you mentioned, it, it has been a lifeline for many businesses and uh, so many businesses have, have, you know, wanting to be compliant and this has really helped them to comply with the county guidelines and continue to operate their businesses. So I just want to express my appreciation for everything you all have been doing to help keep these businesses afloat. Um, I had one question and then I had some comments later. Um, but the one question I had in the agenda was that um, at one point it discusses, you know, working with the plan with planning to draft revisions to the municipal code and downtown plan. And then it mentioned taking these revision commissions. And I was wondering um, if this would go to the planning commission as well, because it sounds like there's revisions being made to the downtown plan. Um, and there's gonna be a lot of work with planning. I was just curious um, in that list of commissions that this that these might go to um, why the planning commission was left out. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think it's available, but we would be taking it to any relevant uh, commissions that it needs to be reviewed by. But we... Sure, I'll chime in. Any changes to the downtown plan would be required to uh, go to the planning commission for recommendation before coming to the council. Great. Yeah, that was my only, I just saw that the planning commission was left out of that list, and so I was curious as to why. And so, thanks for that clarification. And that's those are all the questions right now. Next, we have Councilmember Colin Tari Johnson. 
Thank you so much for the presentation and all the work that you've done to bring it to this point. Um, I had a couple of questions for clarification. Um, so the um, administrative use permits are used to determine hours of operation, security enhancement, and noise restrictions for uh, for businesses that are using private property. Correct? Is that um, so can you can you help um, distinguish um, why don't we have those same concerns for businesses that are using public pro property? Yeah, um, great question. So um, public property uh, is dictated more in terms of uh, the planning department reviews and public works generally, sort of the, the streets and sidewalks in those areas. Um, we do. Uh, for the parklets, we do a design review permit through the planning department. Um, and those public uh, parking areas are typically a lot more in uh, the commercial districts. And um, so there is review and there are conditions of approval that, that do cover those noise requirements and those different things um, as well. Um, and then the administrative use permit process on private property, um, those spaces might be more uh, adjacent to residential areas or just might have more circulation requirements to those different things. Um, so those uh, reviews are done, uh, but there are, it's just between the public and private. Got it, okay. So both, both um, spaces are reviewed. It's just a little bit of a different process is that, um, right. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. And then the permitting costs, does that apply to um, businesses that are um, on both the private and public? Uh, are you saying what the structure of permitting costs will look like? Yeah, did you have a? Well, you, you know, I'm glad this question came up because I, I realized we didn't address this in the staff report and there were some comments about this. You know, one distinction, and we, you know, currently there is a plan, there is a fee for when you submit an application. Um, the distinction that we we were making on the public spaces is on top of any fee, we have an actual parking deficiency. So there's this sort of doubling assessment for uh, those that are doing parklets. Um, let's just say example in the downtown. Um, so we were looking at ways, and that's part of some of the revisions that we're proposing to make that didn't work as well in our pilot uh, parklet program is that we realized um, there were some additional fees there that really didn't need to be there and really trying to streamline that. I think if um, you wanted us to consider saving um, the fees or reducing the fees um, for on private spaces, um, that's definitely something we, we would need to sit down with planning and look at the cost of those. That's just a whole separate process. Um, so I, I think in, from the recovery perspective, I think it makes sense for us to sort of talk through that um, mm -hmm. and look at what the cost of that would be and, and return to you for that discussion. Okay, great. That Helpful. Um, and I just noticed, I, I know that each city is different. I just noticed how low Capitol and Watsonville's permit fees were compared to ours. And um, I don't know if you can comment on that, but theirs was like, I don't know, like this much of what ours was. So, um, but those are my questions. Thank you. I just want to add a bit more uh, context there too. So on the private property side, uh, you know, the businesses go through that permit process and there's sort of one fee um, that happens. There's no ongoing fee for use of that space versus the public sec uh, the public. Uh, property, we have the initial permit fees and then we have the ongoing license fees for the maintenance of those spaces. So just want to make sure that was clear. Great. Are there other um, questions from council members at this point? Not seeing any. Okay, I will go ahead and bring this out to our public attendees now. This will be for item number 20, let me draw my script here, make sure, item number 29. Uh, if you are interested in commenting on this item, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. The timer will be minutes. Uh, I've got the first person with their phone number ending in 7646. Uh, go ahead and press um, star six and you'll get unmuted and you can speak. Seven, there you go. Go ahead, please. Hello. Hi, is, is this working? It is. 
Oh, great. <laughs> Fabulous. Sorry. Hi, uh, my name is Karen Madura, and um, I am the owner of uh, Brady's Yacht Club and um, also the jury room here in Santa Cruz. And um, I just wanted to uh, give everybody on the council and all of the staff um, just a huge thank you and acknowledgement of um, the hard work that has gone into looking at the program. And um, also just to say how absolutely vital it has been um, to the survival of our businesses. And um, we have been working really hard to, um, to just get through this and, and to keep the safety of the public in mind um, during this time. And these patios um, absolutely have been a lifeline. And I know that a lot of people have said that already, but um, you know, I just can't stress enough that without these, we, um, we definitely would have gone on. Um, so, yeah, just a big help and a thank you um, for that. And we are really excited to hear that the city is um, is working to extend this program for us and also to help everybody, um, you know, move forward towards permanence because people absolutely love these patios. Um, they feel very safe for a lot of people, especially with the rise of the Delta variant. We have been, you know, it seems like we're getting hit again, and yet there's... Um, just a lot less, uh, I, I guess, kind of acknowledgement the way that it was the first time around. Um, so this uh, feels a lot safer for a lot of people. Um, and um, we just wanted to also say thank you for um, making the distinction between private property and the um, public property because that was definitely um, getting a little confusing. Um, also, Bonnie sent out an email, um, I believe yesterday, that um, recommended having um, a bunch of the business owners and managers meet up with city staff, and I just wanted to also voice, just voice my support for that. Thank you very much. Donna, you're muted. Barking dog today. Uh, next up is Rami K. And if you could press star six to unmute yourself, please. Hello again. Uh, this is Rami Kayali. I'm the owner of Mellow Mellow Kava Bar. We're a business on the 1100 block. Um, I was one of the first to build a parklet uh, on the public space, and I got hit with a red tag uh, and a warning that I would be fined $1,200 a day unless uh, it met the planning department's requirements. So after talking to an engineer and an architect, the engineer told me it would be $6,000 to get this structure analyzed. So, uh, you know, I, I had to essentially take it down and put up a platform. So now I don't have a shelter on top of the platform that we have. And we're just coming around the corner to hopefully what is gonna be a rainy season, because I know we need that more so than I need a few dollars in my pocket. Um, but I'm kind of curious as to what's gonna be the recourse here for people looking to build a shelter, um, because that's gonna be the largest kind of stick in the mud as we move into the rainy season and you know we're going to be sitting outside because delta is not looking like it's going to relent anytime soon and all the stock has been great but i haven't heard anything about you know sheltering for some of the customers who don't want to sit under an umbrella when it's pouring rain and super windy um and i've seen other cities have already allowed and berkeley where some of my other businesses do have this and i'm just kind of wondering why the city of santa cruz was a working against and uh, not really helping, and then um, B why we're vacillating so long on this and, and what the what the holdup is on doing this. Uh, so those are my two points that I'd like to raise and want to get an answer on. But more importantly, maybe some other avenues for you guys to get a grant for some of these businesses um, or having a pre-approved preferred contractor list and some preferred designs. It just, it's been a year now and we still haven't seen the ball move forward. So thank you. Thank you. Next is Zachary Davis. Hello, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can, go ahead. Hello everyone, thank you. Um, well, to say that um, COVID has forced a lot of us to move outside of our comfort zone, I think is a Fast understatement, and I, I really want to recognize um, 
the work the city has done. Um, I know a lot of what the city does is trying to mitigate risk and reduce liability and stick to compliance and what you all are, are doing for those of us in the in the restaurant industry um, really means a lot in terms of being creative and being flexible and and um, and then looking forward, um, I, I really applaud this decision to create the time, um, which will in turn create the space to look at at what's going on and the best best paths forward, both in the public and private property um, patios and extension areas that have been made. So. Um, recognizing that, that this isn't going away and and the commitment to um, you know the individual level of outreach and creating the time to do that I think is, is really great um, I do think there were some great points brought up by both uh, Karen and Rami um, you know obviously low interest loans potentially forgivable loans things like that that could help out some of the, the businesses that were hit the hardest financially um, could certainly be helpful um, and uh, yeah, just again, really appreciate all the work y'all are doing. Thanks so much. Thank you. Next up is phone number ending in 1424. Hi, this is Dorian from the Downtown Association calling in. I think you guys can hear me. Yeah, okay. Yes, you can. Um, hi. hi. Um, so uh, I'm glad that so many of the businesses downtown are calling in on their own to express um, their appreciation and their concerns about the program to you guys directly. Um, I definitely wanted to speak on behalf of, you know, the 47 downtown outdoor dining area. I know that it has been a lifeline to so many of them. I know that um, they are all so grateful for the really quick work that went into making that possible. Um, and I guess I just wanted to point out a couple things. One is that you know, when I saw Rebecca's timeline, it really hit me that, you know, this started in March and it's really only been the summer months that the restaurants have been able to customers using their outdoor dining areas. So um, this extension of, of, uh, of time on that investment that they've made is I think really critical to those uh, businesses being able to recover that investment. And it certainly has been um, not only a lifeline for those businesses, but really um, the marker of vibrancy down. I mean, alfresco dining has been a visible and vibrant part of life downtown and a really important aspect, I think, of our community's health. So um, we're just really, really appreciative of all the work the city's done that's gone into this program um, so far. And then the one thing I just wanted to point out to council, because I think this is where you guys could really be most supportive is, um, you know, as Rebecca was describing in her, in her presentation, I think quite, quite well, there were only two businesses prior to the pandemic that were able to take advantage of the program the way that it is. So enabling businesses to be able to transition to something permanent does mean changing the permanent program and providing the types of support that you know some of the businesses have already mentioned, like low interest or forgivable loans or grants to actually construct these parklets if that's out of reach for the businesses given you know this uh, the pandemic they've just been through that they're tasked with, um, as well as waiving or modifying our operating fees for use of those spaces on an ongoing basis. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the uh, public that wanted to speak to this item today? If you could press star nine to raise your hand. Okay, bring it back. Oh, I see a number, uh, yeah, phone number ending in 0969. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Go ahead, please. Hey, can't, council members, are you able to hear me? Yes, we are, thank you. Okay, thanks. This is Anthony Carlson, and I work for a distributorship here in, in uh, why cover Santa Cruz as one of my sales territories. And you know, I'm just calling to express my support for, um, I guess, a hopefully permanent solution to, um, to well, I'm calling to support or ask for you to essentially not to speak in too ideal of terms, but to try to remove as much bureaucratic nuance as possible and, and really kind of, um, you know, approach the situation from a triage, you know, uh, standpoint and, and make it as easy as possible for, for all these businesses to uh, not only 
maintain their their current outdoor seating but but you know add to construction and, and make sure that they're able to sustain themselves through the winter and so on and so forth uh, you know I, I i see it a lot when i travel around the bay area for work and um you know it would be i think along the lines of what santa cruz likes to consider itself as in terms of a bike friendly city and a you know a walkable city and so on and i know there are concerns about parking and whatnot but i think um you know when you look at at how how potentially beneficial this could be that a handful of parking spaces or at least temporarily until the new garage is constructed um to me anyway um seems to pale in comparison to, to what we stand to potentially lose if we don't you know do everything possible to support these businesses and yeah that's all i got thanks Thank you. Next up, I have a uh, phone number ending in 7663. Yeah. yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hey, it's uh, Ian McRae. I own Hula's Island Grill and Tiki Room in um, on Cathcart Street. And um, first, I, uh, obviously, I wanna thank the city, everybody that's been involved in, in helping us. Um, through this pandemic has been absolutely amazing. And um, I know I speak for all of us businesses downtown that we feel that way. Um, the couple of things I wanted to bring up, um, one is that, um, you know, that now it seems like the dining experience has now changed dramatically. And I don't see how we're, we can go back. And the reason I say this is what the public is gonna start to, to demand, which is, to sit out outside. Um, I I um, I hate to think about another, you know, variant of this of this COVID coming up, uh, you know, a, a year from now or so. But I think we have to think in those terms. And um, and you know, and now we are you know, actually you know prepared for it. One one of the ancillary benefits I've noticed too is that we've all become a little more green in our businesses, and that's because of the trees that we've planted, the trees the city brought in, the other plantings we've done, and also not having to um, eat and light the insides of our of our building um, has has made us all more green. Um, and then I guess the last thing I wanted to say was I, I did which is probably a topic for another day, but um, uh, a vision of, of Cathcart Street as, as restaurant row from Cedar to, to front and incorporating what's gonna be the sort of pathway to the, um, to the San Lorenzo River. We've got this, you know, there's a potential for I think 15 restaurants on those two blocks um, and we get that great afternoon sun and have kind of a, All right, well, I'm, I'm done. Thank you guys all again. Very appreciative. Thank you, Ian. Seeing any other raised hands, I'll bring it back to council. Um, yeah, I just a uh, quick uh, comment and um, uh, myself before I uh, call on council member Cummings. Um, yeah, I just really want to um, recognize our staff. Um, they have just done amazing work through the entire um, pandemic and um, they've just uh, really, really tried to work um, to help our businesses stay um, viable. And, um, you know, they, they've done that even with um, some obstacles, you know, like uh, rules that were on the books um, and then just trying to kind of rework how we envision the downtown. And I do think, um, I think the last speaker sort of on the head where, you know, I think in general, people just enjoy that experience. Um, and uh, I think we are on to kind of a new realm of expectation in terms of how our, our uh, restaurants compete um, with other areas. And so it's exciting to see people, you know, really enjoying being outside. And um, so I really just want to recognize uh, though our economic development staff, along with a lot of other things that are on your plate, you're also um, really um, paying attention and helping our local businesses um, throughout the city, not just downtown, but throughout the city. So um, I just wanna recognize you guys for that. And um, I will go ahead, um, Bonnie, did you have a response to one of the questions that came up that you wanted to say? 
Yes, uh, thanks, Mayor. And, and first, I just wanted to um, acknowledge your acknowledgement and, and um, say, say a couple things about Rebecca and Nathan, who really have been day in, day out, running this program, working one-on-one -on -one with businesses, with the support of a few other folks on our ED team um, that have been critical, um, and I, I and including David, and just, I also really want to acknowledge across all the departments um, we mentioned them in the staff report, but I'm not expecting the other departments will have read the staff report, but um, this really has not been an effort just of, of ED. It really has been an effort, you know, across the board, fire, PD, you know, parks and rec, public works, you know, traffic planning, and, you know, it's just, it, it really has been a real team effort, and everyone has recognized that, you know, our businesses needed support during this time. So I just wanted to make, make sure spreading the acknowledgement to them because we would not have been able to do this without without their support and understanding and flexibility. Really, they have made this made this possible and made the extension possible as well. Like when we sat down with them and talked through some of the, some of the challenges and there have been, you know, some challenges, they were right at the table helping helping us come up with solutions. So, I did I did want to acknowledge them as well and really uh, um, really grateful that um, we're all working together on this. Um, I also wanted to mention a couple of the suggestions that came up are things that have come up in, in some of our outreach meetings, and that's part of what we want to work on this year. I've mentioned in um, some past council meetings that we've been in discussions um, with Santa Cruz Community Credit Union, who's been a great partner with us during our first microloan program, and we've been talking about being able to put together some grants active loans, but have a forgivable component of the city portion um, to really help the offset of building out some of these parklets. Um, so I did want to mention that um, the suggestion about the pre-approved list of contractors is something that um, was an idea that came up that we we've also have been, have been really something that we want to include um, going forward as well as time. And one thing that came up that I want to acknowledge is that as, as we look at this transitioning to permanent, we also want to acknowledge um, it's not necessarily one size fits all. We definitely do want some designs, but there's different levels of design. There are some that are permanent that are in the temporary program right now that actually with very little effort could become permanent and they still fit within the overall sort of design. It doesn't have to be you know, a $40,000 to $100,000 investment. However, there are some that may be really interested in investing in, you know, a new design that are just now using the, you know, the, wa the water barriers or the K rails, and those can be where we have some of these grants going forward if, if they want to um, really make that investment. So I guess my, my point is that we do see that there could be a range of options for transitioning to permanent and recognize it's not necessarily one size fits all. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Bonnie. Council member Cummings. Thank you. Well, um, I just want to thank everyone again for all their hard work. And as Bonnie mentioned, you know, there's so many departments in the city that um, deserve recognition for all the work on this because, you know, moving people into the street is not necessarily the safest thing, but we've managed to do it in a way that's been safe. And so, you know, there's a lot of um, appreciation that needs to go out to all those other businesses. Um, I'm, I have been speaking with a lot of the business owners over the past few, not only days, but weeks as we've been leading up to this point and, um, and months, you know, with everything that's happened last year with COVID. And um, I know that they're really going to appreciate um, you know, being able to extend their outdoor services, especially if they can move to, to permanent. And so I've wanted to prepare a motion to make that, Build mostly on the staff's recommendation. And um, Bonnie, I was actually wondering maybe if I could share my screen so I could just highlight where the major changes came in. And then maybe if you could put that up after. But um, I thought that, um, let's see. This might be an easier way so I can just highlight the changes. But the motion would be to number one, bring back um, on or before the second meeting in October, a revised temporary outdoor expansion program emergency ordinance that A, extends the temporary period for outdoor seating in public and private spaces, currently set to expire at the end of this December through December 31st, 2022. Two, direct staff to work with businesses operating these spaces to make any necessary changes needed to address maintenance and help aid transition to permanent programs prior to the emergency ordinance expiration. Three direct staff working on the necessary revisions to the municipal code 
for future council consideration to reflect the desire to expand outdoor seating in private and public on-street parking, parklet citywide, including A, finalizing the revisions to the parklet design guidelines, including approved platform designs and materials, safety features, accessibility requirements, and shade materials, and B, revising the fee structure for parklets and private outdoor seating and evaluate the potential to waive, modify, or offset fees on an appropriate time scale to facilitate pandemic business recovery, and then added in the fourth staff recommendation that we heard today. And just to provide a little bit of explanation on the changes, um, you know, in case it takes longer than September 28th, I was just thinking that maybe we could build in a little bit more flexibility. And I spoke with staff on Friday and they said that that might be beneficial on their end as well. So, um, you know, really expressing the intent that we do want this to come back as soon as possible, but if we need to build in some more flexibility for staff, that we can provide them that time frame. Um, with uh, A, I just added in um, private, public and private spaces. It sounded like from staff's perspective, that's, that was the intent is to expand outdoor dining for everyone through uh, December 31st, 2022. Um, I eliminated B because it's, it sounded like in two, number two, we captured uh, what we were trying to get across in B, which is directing staff to work with businesses to help aid that transition to a permanent program prior to the, the uh, expiration of the emergency ordinance. So it seemed like, um, you know, what B was really trying to get at was working with businesses on private properties and extending that deadline, um, but by incorporating private into A, and then you know with the language that says that we're directing staff to work with businesses to aid to permanent programs, um, it seemed like that captured everything, so there wasn't really a need to have B. Um, and then I added private to um, number three. Um, it's come up a number of times in our conversation today that there might be opportunities, depending on how businesses are operating, to look at our municipal code around the administrative use permit. And if it seems like there might be a need to change some of the um, language in that, this is an opportunity for us to really take a look at that. And so providing this direction would, would um, give staff that flexibility and the opportunity to bring forward any necessary changes to that administrative use permit process on private property. And then, um, I think we did hear some comments from other council members. I think council member Calentary Johnson was bringing up the private fees that and the fees around um, use of outdoor dining that differ between other, other jurisdictions and ourselves. And if there's an opportunity for us to potentially, you know, um, lower those fees for these businesses that are operating outdoors during this period, um, maybe we can do that. And then um, I changed from the offset from one to two years to on an appropriate time scale because you know, we still don't know what's going to happen with COVID. And I mean, we just, prior to this, uh, or after I should say the agenda report came out, we got the mandate from the, the county health officer to, um, you know, have masks indoors. So just building in more flexibility around time scales so that we're not kind of um, holding ourselves to a specific time and having to bring this back and forth. Um, and then I added in the staff recommendation. So that's the motion um, that I, I was making and and that's all I have. And I also noticed that there were two members of the public who raised their hands after um, we closed out. So I don't know if there was any desire to um, have those people speak. Yeah, I was going to go back that way myself. Um, so go ahead and go back out. Um, technically, we closed public comment, but I see two hands raised. So I'll go ahead and go back out to public comment. Um, we are kind of running late by about a half an hour. So I'm just trying to keep 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 us rolling here. So. Um, phone number ending in 6302, please. You could press star six to unmute yourself. Hi there. This is uh, Tristan. I uh, wanted to air a couple of the things that have already been mentioned, but also just sort of go over the importance of what this means, uh, not only to the community, but also outside of that community, uh, meaning restaurants, bars, gyms, et cetera. Um, I work in the distribution side as well, similar to Anthony, who spoke earlier, and just the impact that this, as far as financially, uh, it's really impactful. I mean, what you guys have been able to do by adding these parklets and keeping these businesses in business is just keeping so many other businesses in business. <laughs> um, from the drivers that are making these deliveries, 
to you know the people that are actually visiting and, and you know uh, patronizing these businesses to someone like me, um, you know, a sales representative trying to you know stay uh, from being furloughed and, and looking for other work outside of our community. Um, I just want to say thank you for being able to put these things in place and uh, the impact that they're having outside of just that world. And I, I just I just hope that you guys are very aware of how grateful that we are for you allowing us to continue to work. It's, it's very impactful on, on a lot of different aspects outside of just what's happening within the restaurant. Um, same thing with the food service people, um, you know, who are actually delivering this food and keeping these restaurants going. Um, without this, we would lose a big part of our culture in the community. Um, I think you know, being able to have these outside uh, spaces has allowed the community to have some semblance of normality while doing it in a safe and appropriate way, as well as the beautification that, you know, these parklets have provided versus just parking spots. Um, I, you know, I really love going through our downtown area now. As I know many others have as well, in comparison to how it, you know, has been. Um, I think it's just a wonderful addition. So I just want to say thank you for all the work that you're doing, and please keep up this good work. The more permanence of these sort of things and the ability to build out um, these parklets or these private property parking lots have been converted into patios. I mean, it's it's just a wonderful thing, and I hope it can just continue to grow because it's keeping you know it's keeping me afloat with the job. So I really appreciate uh, everything that you guys are doing. Thank you very much. Next caller is Laura. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, uh, um, I don't want to take up too much time. This is Laura. I own Russian downtown. And I also want to thank everyone for this consideration. Um, I think we've learned uh, that, that CD not only helps with COVID-19, but we've also reduced the transmission of all the other colds and illnesses that go around, and it's just an all-around healthier aspect. And also just that a lot of the businesses are barely kind of, we're just barely trying to get out of our um, economic crisis. And even though the, the throes of the pandemic with the vaccine have kind of subsided a little bit, we're all really just at the beginning of re recouping everything. And so the outdoor seating has been a lifeline as other people have already said. And so I just want to say thank you and I look forward to seeing what changes are going to happen. Great. Thank you, Laura. Okay. I'll bring it back over to council. There's a motion on the floor. Um, is there a second for that motion? And I just want to double check with um, staff or are, are those changes amenable to you folks? You, you know, and looking at them, I think they all look fine. I, I would like to recommend on um, council member Cummings, is, is this his version? No. No. Did, oh, did you make these changes, yes. Bonnie? Yes. This is his version. Okay. Oh, okay. There is. Um, that on number three, where it says direct staff to start working on the necessary, could we add the word any necessary? And the, the, I, I think I just clarify that because we, we don't know yet until so that uh, the public parklets are not addressed adequately at all. There is, it's pretty flexible, we think, on for the private spaces, but if we just add that word any, I think um, that clarifies the intent. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, Council Member Brown. That was just the motion. Thank you, and thanks, Bonnie, for weighing in. So we have a motion by Council Member Cummings that's up on the screen and seconded by Council Member Brown and Council Member Watkins. Um, I just had a, a quick question or, or comment. Well, one, I'll just echo all the appreciation for our team and, and everybody who's involved and, and just also the communication strategy with the businesses based on, and in general, it's nice to have outdoor seating. So all around a good thing. Um, in regards to potential fee structure changes and funding and resources, I'm just wondering how any of the recovery dollars could factor into that, especially in some of these immediate kind of circumstances we're in right now? You know, I think just knowing our overall city financial picture and that the funding coming in is less than what our structural deficit, I, I think at least what our initial recommendation would be for us to really look at our ED trust fund to see what we could recommend as an offset. So I think that's part of what we'll look at and come, come back with you um, to really have a discussion in your consideration. 
Is there any um, uh, potential for some of the like county business development dollars, like how that could factor in potentially into a resource that's available countywide for business development? We'll certainly follow up with them and, and see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great, thanks. Great, if there's not any other questions, we'll go ahead and take a roll call vote. We have a motion um, by Council Member Cummings, seconded by Council Brown. Council Member Brown, and uh, let's do the roll call. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Watkins? Aye. Mm -hmm. Calendari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner has disqualified herself and Mayor Myers. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Great, thank you for every, all the work you guys. Um, next up we have item number 30 and this is a request from the Homeless Garden Project to relocate the site of the planned Pogonet Farm and Garden from the lower main meadow to the upper main meadow in the Pogonet for open space. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. We have translation services available for this item. These instructions will also be provided on the screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, and I believe the Homeless Garden Project is here today too to participate in the presentation followed by questions from the city council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. So I will go ahead and turn this over to Noah Downey, our park planner, and I believe also Kathy Calfo from the Homeless Garden Project uh, is also uh, here today as part of this presentation. Hi, Noah. Nolan and uh, Tony Elliott will be providing the presentation. Okay, Tony. Yeah, thanks, yeah, Noah. Really and, um, sorry to uh, interrupt. I'm, sorry. I'm so oh. sorry. Um, I'm wondering if we should have Peter um, kind of explain how the interpretation module works. Sure. Here. If that works, yeah, sure. Is Peter on? I don't see him in the list, um, but I don't recognize his cell phone. He, he, is, he is on. He's on, okay. Go ahead, Peter, if you could uh, explain the process, um, if that was clear to you. So we're gonna do a presentation by um, the staff and then the uh, Homeless Garden Project would like to participate in that presentation. And then we will bring it back for questions um, before we uh, bring it out for public comment. So now Peter is not here, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I don't know where he went, he was here earlier, but okay. Okay, okay, well, we'll move on. Um, we're running a little bit late, so if Peter um, comes back on, Bonnie, just text me and we'll, uh, oh, we'll go from there. I see, I see him now. Yes, hi, Peter. Uh, you're muted, uh, Peter, can you? He's not muted, it's, be I'm gonna, Peter. Oh, I'm he's doing translation, to got it. Peter, I'm gonna remove you as a translator and then I'll add you as a translator again, okay. Thanks, can you hear me now? Can you all hear me now? Yep. Okay, yeah, it's when we go into the interpretation, it's this weird thing about Zoom, then you can't hear me at this uh, zone that only the people who require translation. Anyway, let me translate for the, because I think most people were gonna be listening to it, not really going on their computer and translate and looking for translation through a chat. Eh, para los que nos están escuchando y lo que eh, para, eh, queremos anunciarles, primero me llamo Peter Bichier, soy el vocero de la comunidad, voy a estar aquí traduciendo un poquito lo que está pasando y queremos eh, presentar lo que, lo que está pasando con el uh, Homeless Garden Project, un proyecto de, 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 de ellos para tratar de eh, ocupar la parte de Pogonet eh, y entonces estaré yo interpretando ese, ese tópico ahorita. Thank you, Peter. Okay, I will go ahead and turn this over to Tony and um, we'll go, for, and I see Kathy's on as well. Welcome, Kathy. Hi, thank you, Mayor Myers and City Council. For the record, Tony Elliott, Parks and Recreation Director. 
Uh, our park superintendent, Travis Beck, uh, is also here, as well as parks planner, Noah Downing, um, and Kathy Calfo from Homeless Garden Project as well. So I'll turn it over to uh, Kathy in just a couple moments after some uh, introductory remarks. And Peter uh, and his time um, uh, as well, so thanks. Um, so just a little bit of uh, background, um, primarily for the public, I think the council is aware, but the Parks and Recreation Department uh, has a Poganet Master Plan that was approved in 1998. Uh, the Master Plan designates the Lower Main Meadow as a site and a garden to be developed and managed by the Homeless Garden Project. In uh, late 2018, uh, the city discovered um, evidence of lead contamination in the lower meadow as a result of historic skeet shooting. So in light of this contamination, the Homeless Garden Project is seeking an alternative location uh, for the home of its future farm. Um, with the city council packet is a letter from the Homeless Garden Project to the city council uh, with a proposal to amend the Poganet Master Plan uh, in order to provide an opportunity to move their farm development from the lower meadow to the upper meadow. Uh, the proposal from Homeless Garden Project includes uh, suggested text edits to the Pogan Master Plan and conceptual site maps from in the upper meadow. So um, a Homeless Garden Project has done some initial soil testing in the upper meadow uh, and plans to conduct a biotic assessment uh, in the spring of 2022. Um, the Pogonet Master Plan provides a vision for the intended use of the upper meadow, which is to preserve and restore the meadow for the purposes of habitat and sensitive species, and to renovate the Pogonet for education purposes and special events. Uh, and undoubtedly, Homeless Garden Project serves a, a very noble and important cause uh, here in Santa Cruz. The Parks and Recreation staff, along with the planning department, see the proposal from Homeless Garden Project as a potentially significant change from the current plan uh, and the, the vision for the for meadow. So to that end, we recommend that the consideration of amendments to the master plan uh, include an open and public process. Um, amendments to the Pogonet master plan will uh, potentially have um, or will have um, real costs uh, associated with staff time, CEQA review, um, and may have opportunity costs such as affecting to implement the vision uh, for the Poganet Clubhouse as set forth by the master plan. So just want to share this to provide, uh, again, just kind of the staff perspective on uh, the proposal before the council. So should the council uh, give direction today to consider amendments to the Poganet master plan, staff recommend that the item be considered by the Parks and Recreation Commission as a next step. Um, and I'll just say that Homeless Garden Project has been a, a partner of the city and of Parks and Recreation for many, many years. Um, and I think on behalf of, uh, of both of us, uh, it's been a frustrating challenge to learn about uh, and really face these issues with contamination in the lower meadow. So as we try to grapple with this and talk about the future of uh, the farm and the park, the open space here, uh, we just really sincerely appreciate uh, the feedback um, and guidance from the city council on this topic. So uh, with that introduction, I wanna um, hand it over to Kathy Calfo with Homeless Garden Project. Thanks, Tony. I think um, Bonnie Bush is gonna share a slide presentation for me. I was afraid to, <laughs> to learn the technology on this. While she's doing that, I will just let you know that I'm a former board president of the Homeless Garden Project and was co-chair of the capital fundraising campaign for the farm at Poganet. Um, I also want to say that Derry Ganshorn, who I know you all know, who's the executive director of the project, is dying that she's not here with you this afternoon. Um, but she plane and she's on the way to the East Coast to see her grandkids for the first time since before COVID and to meet one of them for the first time. So we really miss her and, and it's tough to fill in for her, but I will do my best. Um, I also want to mention that the Homeless Garden Project Board Chair Beth Gummery is tuning in along with a number of board members, staff and community and Claude Rosen, the project operations director, is here with me in case you have any questions that for some reason I'm not able to answer. Um, I'm gonna start uh, before we roll the slides with just giving a quick background for everyone about the Homeless Garden Project. 
And to say two things, it's really bittersweet for us to be here. We thought at this time we'd be holding our groundbreaking. We raised three and a half million dollars to park. I expected to be breaking ground at this time. Um, but in many ways, we believe that this process is potentially leading us to a better place. Um, I also want to stress that we really believe in the democratic process. We're strong um, protectors of the environment, and we are looking forward to a very open and transparent process as we now with the community what our proposal is. So the background on the Homeless Garden Project is that the project provides a job training in the form of paid transitional employment with support services to unhoused men and women. The 12-month program can serve up to 20 trainees currently. At Poganip, over time, we see that expanding to 50. Program uh, participants are connecting food assistance, health services, and one-on-one -on -one social work to help them support their goals. Tracking our results, and this is probably the most important thing I want to tell you in this part of the presentation, over the past seven years, the project reports that 97% of graduates move into a steady source of income and 90% get into housing. That's a pretty amazing feat for a very small project that has an annual budget of $1.2 million a year. And it wouldn't be possible without the engagement on a regular basis, not during COVID, but under normal conditions of, you know, between 2,500 and 3,000 volunteers every year who work out on the farm side by side with unhoused men and women who are working to change their lives. And it's a mutually supportive relationship. Um, volunteers learn a lot about it, what it means to be unhoused in Santa Cruz the city of Santa Cruz, and then the unhoused really feel like there's a community there supporting them, which makes a big difference and I think contributes to those results. One last thing about the project that a lot of people don't know is that we share a lot of healthy food and produce with community members that wouldn't have access to it otherwise. We distribute almost 700 shares of organic produce through 10 community agencies, including, for example, hospice, and work with Growing the Table to distribute 6,000 boxes of organic produce to about 20 agencies and to the Galt School. So I'm going to recap on the next slide, if we could get it, um, a little bit of the timeline that Tony started to go over. The Pogonet Master Plan was adopted in 1998. Um, I never thought I would read a full EIR or the full Pogonet Master Plan. But as we started encountering some of the challenges Tony described, we did. And one of the thing is that in the Pogonet Master Plan, the Homeless Garden Project is identified as an essential component, um, which I'd never really run across before. But the project didn't pick where it would be cited. That was a given when the environmental review was done. But the project was always looked at in the EIR and in the document as a key component of the project. Um, when the uh, master plan included the Homeless Garden Project, the Homeless Garden Project, I think, initially was farming on Pelton Avenue before the city sold that land. Uh, it's moved now over to Natural Bridges. The project has never had a permanent home, and so this was really a dream for us. Um, and we've been on land donated by Ron Swenson on the west side for uh, over 20 years now. He, as a lot of you know, has plans to put housing on that property and has been very anxious for us to move off, which is the urgency that we're, some of the urgency that we're feeling here. In between 1998 and 2008, the Homeless Garden Project really worked to build its infrastructure, and I think under the leadership of Derry Ganshorn really proved that the program could work, strengthened it, started to show the kinds of results that we're seeing now. And we have the kind of program that today, when we can build a permanent home, we'll be able to double and eventually triple the number of people we serve. Um, in May 2017, after a lot of work, we met the conditions um, to have the city approve a lease for the Lower Meadow at Poganip, and we launched a capital campaign. 
that capital campaign, as we mentioned, I was the co-chair of, and we raised three and a half million dollars, which is you know, a re very successful campaign, I think really demonstrates the community support. But I wanna stress again, this is three and a half million dollars of community money that we're bringing to the table to invest in a city park. And I don't think that's something that happens every day. I think it's kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, and we're excited and proud of that and wanna be a good partner both with the city and with the whole community. Um, the site that we're looking at, the Lower Meadow, is very complex. Um, in order to get to the point that we could get the design permit, which we got in September of 2018, we had to conduct a number of studies, do quite a bit of engineering work, get numerous permits, and we spent about $150,000 on those to get to the design, design permit phase in 2018. Then in December 2019, we concluded the capital campaign and hired a contractor who was ready to start construction in January. Just as they were out there, we got word from the city that we had to stop construction. That was a pretty heartbreaking moment for all of us, I have to say, um, including people at the Parks Department. We all shared in, in the discipline. Um, we stopped construction, um, and if you go to the next slide, began to uh, talk about how to move forward, uh, knowing that the reason the construction was halted was that there had previously been skeet shooting it have created some lead contamination. Interestingly, none of this was ever identified or looked at in the environmental impact reports or in the master plan that was done earlier. So it was a pretty stunning surprise for everyone. It took us some time to pivot um, for a couple of reasons. For one, the city didn't have funding to help us begin the soil testing, and so it took some time to do some grant proposals and secure funding to do the testing. And then once we got going on the testing, COVID hit, so we discovered that labs were backed up and weren't able to process them quickly. But eventually we got the results back and by this time, I'll just share with you the sort of internal community of homeless garden projects, the board of directors in particular, had a lot of concerns about mixing uh, organic farming and a community project where volunteers work in the soil with the potential of lead contamination. Um, as one of the people working on the committee to make this project happen and working with Derek Danforn, she and I decided in our minds that if we could come up with about four acres of farmable land or meadow. We had invested enough money that we wanted to keep going. The full board had, I mean, to say they had mixed feelings is an understatement. A lot of concerns about the idea of, of farming, keeping people safe in that area. But we managed to convince them moving forward in good faith with our donors and the community commitments that we had made. and. They agreed to do that so long as we would continue to explore other options at Poganit to see if we could either possibly clean up other areas, if we could identify other land to put the farm on. So we were kind of working on multiple tracks, moving forward with the lower, also beginning to explore what other options there might be to let, add on to the farming area. In our minds, that was gonna be much later, you know, maybe in three to five years. We hired a new contractor to begin building the farm and it didn't take him, you know, probably more than a couple of weeks to come back to us and say, you know, you can't build a farm on the site. Um, it's not just for him, it wasn't so much about the lead content health impacts that the board had been worried about, although you know, we're certainly concerned. But from a construction point of view, he thought this site was virtually impossible to build on. Um, there are wetlands, there are endangered species, there's a, 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 I'm gonna go through a chart comparing the two sites in a minute. But from him, from a construction point of view, working around the contamination and areas that had various levels of lead contamination, including the road between the two areas that were deemed farmable. There's a road and utilities were to be run through that road. Construction costs would have to involve cleaning that up 
um, which it, it's unclear whether that would mean hauling contaminated soil out or what kind of remediation would have to take. But his assessment was that this project was gonna cost us twice as much money as we had raised at a minimum. And he strongly urged us to identify another site uh, working with parks. And so that's when our committee really dug in, no pun intended, to other potential areas at Poganip and landed on the upper meadow. If you can go to the next slide. I think the best way I can explain in why we on the upper meadow as the best alternative after we reviewed the EIR and the documents was when we put together this comparison and looked at the different pros and cons. The building site in the lower, develop, lower meadow is brand new development on, other than lead contamination, what would otherwise have been pristine land. Upper meadow, the existing area had been previously developed. The clubhouse was there, but I, I used to go there in the 80s when I worked at the Board of Supervisors for lunch when it was a restaurant and there were swimming pools and a tennis court. Those have all been covered up. So where we're proposing to put the farm structures is near the clubhouse where there used to be already developed land that's now covered up previously a swimming pool and tennis court. Coastal Terrace Prairie is identified in the EIR as an important resource to protect. We would be converting six acres about in the lower meadow and the upper meadow in the area that we've identified, which could change as public review goes on. There would only be about three and a half acres. Wetlands, there are multiple in the low, lower meadow. This is part of what logistically made creating a farm down there so challenging. There are no wetlands in the area that we're proposing to farm. Slopes in multiple areas in the lower meadow that we were having to do a, a lot of design accommodation for and uh, farm design around to take into account erosion on the slopes. There are none in the area that we're proposing to farm in the upper meadow. Tree removal was very significant. We already had permits when we were uh, stopped, construction was stopped to do extensive tree removal in the lower meadow, including more than 20 heritage trees. In the upper meadow, we'd only be removing some minor trees in the uh, building site. Skeet shooting we've talked about, utilities we think are much, uh, more practical in the upper meadow. And then we will have contiguous farm area up there. We're in the lower meadow. Um, I, well, if we go to the next picture, I think, oh no, it's not on the next picture, never mind. <laughs> um, the, on the lower meadow, you would have uh, two step areas separated by a very large wetland gully. So having the upper area is much better. And, I'm going to the next slide, but go ahead. Uh, I just realized that we do have a map that I can get you of what we're proposing that I had intended to put in here that shows how exactly how the buildings would be laid out, and they're in the packet that the council received along with the um, work on the amendments that we did. Really, our thought on that was we wanted to make the process as well defined as we could as we head into it. We fully expect that the professional staff and others will look at the amendments we propose, add to them potentially, evaluate them, that it would go through a full open and transparent process. But we did engage with a number of uh, well-respected land use consultants, I think, who helped us define what we think is a minor amendment to the Poganet Master Plan, simply to move this existing facility from the lower meadow to the upper meadow, and then of course undertake the environmental review that would be needed. We are asking for the council to direct staff to initiate an amendment process at Master Plan. I'm not gonna read all of this to you, but just the gist of it. Place discussion of the proposed amendment on the September Parks Commission agenda to get early feedback, to initiate the amendment process as expeditiously as possible. Um, raising three and a half million dollars was tough work and now keeping it is really tough work. Uh, some of the foundations and individuals who have donated to this are beginning to ask what the status of the project is. I think COVID going on, uh, people just figured, you know, that everything was delayed. But 
it is important to us to keep faith with those donors in the community to be able to lay out a clear timeline, even if it's a long So I think this is a really seminal moment for the project and we want a lot of clarity and a lot of reassurance for the donors and the community that we are um, moving forward in a responsible way. So that's why we're asking also for regular uh, reports on this. One of our trainees was going to speak to you this afternoon and she had to work at a second job at 4 p.m. But I am gonna share my screen with you and pull up a video that she was able to record at the farm just before she had to go to work. So bear with me for just a minute and I will attempt to share this. I have to pull that first one. Yeah. Got someone helping me here, one second. Okay, I'm with the one sec. <laughs> Share. I'm going to click on that. told me just a few short months ago that I would have been asked to speak for the city of Santa Cruz, honestly, I would have told you that you were crazy. I don't think they're no one tells it. you that life is easy, but I believe it's as hard as you make it. One sec, one sec, give me one more minute. <laughs> Kathy, oh, Bonnie, you, wanna, you can also email it to me if you want. I can. You know what I was worried, Bonnie, is that the, um, that the file might be too big. Oh. Mm -hmm. Does she have sharing? Um, Bonnie, did you give her sharing capability? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Kathy, we can hear it, but we're not seeing it for some reason. I don't know if you can, you have to have it on your open on your screen and then press share screen and then start the video. Okay, one sec. So open the video and then go down to the green box on Zoom and say share screen and you'll see the, your, your actual computer screen show up and you want to click on that and then that will put the video in front of us and then you pr you'll press play. Okay, uh, great. I think we just figured it out. I had to change a number of uh, permissions on my computer. So I'm going to share screen. And then I'm going to open this one more time. Yeah, we're not seeing it yet. You won't be able to see it once you share it. Only we'll be able to see it. Okay, bear with me one minute. Yep. Yeah. Where? Well, I'm really sorry. We, oh, we tried our best. Okay. Um, we were hearing the we were hearing the audio. If you want, can to I play back. it for you? Do you mind? And you can. It's a shame you can't see her because she's so eloquent. But if it's okay, I'm going to play it. Yes, please go ahead. Okay. I mean, just a few short months ago, that I would have been asked to speak for the city of Santa Cruz. Honestly, I would have told you that you were crazy. No one tells you that life is easy, but I believe it's as hard as you make it. And for me, I made my life extremely hard for a long time. However, my life didn't start out that way, and it doesn't have to end that way either. My name is Rachel Summers. I'm 27 years old, and I am a trainee at the Homeless Garden Project. I was born into a loving family in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, my sister Erica was born two minutes later, and we both went on to what seemed to me as a normal life. My parents provided for my sister and I the best they could. They, we went on family vacations. We made family traditions, and they gave us a love and support. 
for instability. With all these things, I still never felt like an individual. For 18 years, I lived in the same house, I went to the same school, and had the same dysfunctional family that made me think that the chaos was normal. My mom was an alcoholic from the time I was born until the time I was about 12 or 13. She has been sober ever since. She was and continues to be one of my biggest role models and teachers and leaders in this journey for me. Watching my mom get to see the promises that sobriety brings had a huge positive impact in our relationship at the time where I needed my mom the most. Unfortunately, I did not learn from my mom's mistakes. I just heard stories and used them as ideas, bad decisions. My sister and I were always expected to have good grades, be home for dinner at 7 p.m. every night, and follow strict rules. However, as I grew older, every freedom, every drop of freedom I got, the more trouble I would find myself in. Drugs and alcohol came into my life at a young age. I was arrested three times before I even graduated high school. Uh, everything ranging from shoplifting to distributions of narcotics. My sister became my partner and my partner in crime and my best friend. This was right before we were to be separated by hundreds of miles for the next eight years. After all my trouble in high school and longing for independence, I moved to San Diego for school all by myself and my sister moved to, UCS, moved to Santa Cruz and went to UCSD. No one knew that I was a twin in San Diego. I could finally be my own person. This started a journey of changing my geography to change my problems. For a long part of my life, I blamed my problems on anyone but myself. I would find any excuse to blame them on anyone or anything else. Two years in San Diego and then five years back in my hometown of St. Louis, Missouri, landed me in some of the very high and very low places. Some of the best memories of my life was in that time. I met many amazing people, graduated from college, I started a job, and I became a dog mom for the next 10 years. Uh, this time also led to many broken hearts, many stressful, abusive relationships, unhealthy jobs. I found myself doing drugs on a daily basis. With all those things I gained, my choices caused me to lose everything. Due to my addiction, I lost every single job I ever had, countless relationships, material items, my dignity, and most of all, my self-respect. So I decided to run from my problems once again. January of 2020, I made the decision to move to Orange County by myself, escape some of the wreckage I had caused. I wanted a fresh start. I wanted my problems to disappear. However, I only brought them with me. A dozen more jobs lost, moving from place to place and burning every bridge along the way. This run took me to a new low. I found myself homeless for the first time, facing a whole trauma I knew nothing about. I crossed lines I never thought I would. I became a different person using any drugs I could get my hands on to forget about where I was. My family didn't even know if I was alive or dead. Out of what I thought was one last ounce of desperation, I finally contacted my sister in Santa Cruz and asked if I could stay, come stay with her to get back on my feet. Santa Cruz has always had a special place in my heart. After every year, this town quickly became my home away from home. Having had the opportunity to live here has been one of the best and one of the worst things that ever happened to me. Um, I quickly landed back on the streets in Santa Cruz, living in a tent and doing any drugs I could get my hands on once again to forget about where I was. I got involved in a very abusive and manipulative re relationship. I just wanted to survive. This round landed me in the hospital for three days with pancreatitis, potassium deficiency, and excruciating withdrawals. When I heard my dad tell me, I don't want to bury you, as I lay helpless in Dominican Hospital, I decided I finally had enough. Um, the nurse handed me a list of resources in the area and a homeless garden project at the top. I started an inpatient drug and alcohol treatment program when I got out of the hospital. They made all the clients get jobs and the homeless garden project instantly popped into my mind. Walking up to the, first, the farm for the first time, it's something I will never forget. There's a beautiful community of people from all different backgrounds 
for a common goal. My whole life, I always struggled to find a sense of self or a sense of happiness. I always tried searching for ways to fit in in order to be looked at as an individual. I finally stopped looking for happiness in different locations, uh, different relationships, jobs, schools, etc. The sense of happiness I get from being a part of the Homeless Garden Project has changed my life in more ways than I could ever explain. This is something I had never done before, so I do believe the quote, your vibe attracts your tribe. In such a short time, I have learned every flower on the farm, and I've picked all my favorites. I've learned to prep plant beds. I've learned to plant and harvest crops, make trellises, identify pests, and so many more farm tasks. But most importantly, I have seen a project go from seed to part of a salad in our lunch. I have learned to persevere in times of challenge, giving up. I met some of the strongest people I've ever met in my life to inspire me to be the best version of myself that I can be every day. I've dedicated myself to a community that I can now call my family, as Elise would say. Since starting as a trainee at the Homeless Garden Project, I have obtained two other jobs that I love. My employers can depend on me to show up on time, to perform to the best of my abilities. I used to wake up every day dreading what the day would bring. I struggled with depression and anxiety and so much fear. I didn't believe I was worthy of being happy, joyous, and free. Now every morning I wake up and I'm excited to go to the farm and be part of something bigger than myself. I'm learning time management, dependability, teamwork, and leadership skills at the Homeless Garden Project. I can apply to any job I get after I graduate. I was always running to escape my problems. Now I have finally found a place to plant my roots and see the finished product a year from now. Much like a beautiful dahlia that starts as a seed, evolves as it grows, faces challenges, and becomes a beautiful flower by the end. The Homeless Garden Project has changed my life in more ways than I could have ever dreamed of. I am so excited to see what this year brings for me and the impact that I can make at the Homeless Garden Project. Thank you. So, thank you. I was just ask if we could pull up that last slide again, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. And as I said, Claude Rosen is here with me. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, I will bring this back to the city council um, to see if there are questions for Tony, Elliot, or Kathy at this point in time. And council questions at all. Okay. One um, back with the motion. I'm sorry, it was what I. Yeah, go ahead and yeah, let's yeah put that up. Um, Tony, my understanding, um, what's being requested here is that um, um, you'll have to you will I would assume have to come back with a work plan, sort of description and costs. Um, you anticipate having you'll be able to get that ready um, based on working with the with the with HTP. Uh, yes, yeah, based on this motion language here. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, okay. Well, without any questions from council, uh, Renee, go ahead. I'm sorry, council member Golden. Sorry, I have one quick question. A couple of members of the public uh, just reached out to me and, and one was wondering um, so what the process would be for public input in regards to this um, and the timeline in regards to this amendment. Because if that's for me, I'll just say that's what we're asking for the park director and the planning director and the staff to come back and tell you so that we all know the answers to those questions. Yeah. Tony, do you have a comment on that? Yeah. Um, yeah, just uh, looking at this motion before us, I think the first step, and this is really consistent with what staff recommended, would be uh, the Parks and Recreation Commission uh, on September 13th. Um, and then following that meeting, uh, again, looking at this uh, motion here, I think reporting back to council on September 28th. So I think at that time we would have more detail in terms of, you know, what does this process really look like in terms of CEQA, public engagement, um, and a lot of these other uh, factors that Kathy um, acknowledged, the so lease and, um, uh, further testing and so forth, I think we would work uh, to come back by that September 28th date. 
Creek process, but in the immediate term, it would be that September 13th Parks Commission meeting. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Contari Johnson. Thank you, and thanks for the presentation and the, um, at least the audio part of the video. Um, I, there was a, a comment and a suggestion by one community member who hadn't heard about um, and was also concerned about community input and engagement. And the suggestion was that um, there, so there are posters up at Pogo Nip right now for the original project. Um, so to post something um, along with those uh, posters um, of these proposed changes and what the community process would be. So just an, just an additional touch point for folks. Great, I think that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Okay, we'll bring this out to the public now, uh, seeing no other uh, hands up by uh, council members. Um, so this is for item number 31, considering, excuse me, item 30, um, relocating the homeless garden project to the side of the, uh, to the upper meadow, a main meadow in Poganip. And uh, if you do wanna speak on this item, you wanna raise your hand by pressing star nine. I see a caller with a uh, phone number ending in 1332. And if you press star six to unmute yourself, you'll have two minutes. Yes, hello, my name is Kelly Damewood. I'm the, sorry, my dad barks just as I start. My name is Kelly Damewood. I'm the CEO of CCOF. And I just wanted to express my strong support for evaluating the relocation to the Upper Meadow. We're a nonprofit founded in Santa Cruz in 1973. We maintain our headquarters on the west side of town. We work with over 4,000 diverse organic producers through North America and employ over 120 full-time staff. We are accredited by the U.S. Department of Agriculture to certify operations to federal organic standards, and we're super proud to certify the Homeless Garden Project. They really are stewards of the land, and this relocation would give them ample opportunity to deepen their impact. Organic practices are scientifically proven to increase soil organic matter, sequester carbon, um, Organic farmers intentionally cultivate biodiversity of pollinators and beneficial insects and protect fragile natural resources such as rivers, creeks, and nearby water bodies. In addition to supporting the Homeless Garden Project's stewardship of the land, we're Santa Cruz residents and we know firsthand how needed these services are for folks experiencing homelessness in our community. We are continually inspired by how Homeless Garden Project transforms lives through cultivating the land and seeding change. Um, you know, I just really hope that this committee can remain firm in holding extractive practices, but embrace generative practices of this project. Um, I really hope that we can help our community members experiencing homelessness and expand opportunities for our community to experience a healthy, nutritious, organic farm. So we're, we're really excited about this opportunity for Homeless Garden Project to expand and deepen their impact, both to the land and community members. Um, so really hope that you can support evaluating this project. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I have... Phone number ending in 8712, please. Press star six to unmute yourself. Hi. My name is Julia Huff, and I'm here with my husband. Mi nombre es Guillermo Cantos. And uh, apologies, we're in a bilingual family here and having difficulty accessing the Spanish um, interpreter. Um, but we are we are friends of Pobonip, um, and um, we'd like to propose uh, the restoration of the Pobonip Clubhouse and polo fields to create indoor outdoor spaces for the community to meet, socialize, you know, to create a, a mixed use educational center. And, uh, you know, looking to the UCSC Hay Barn as an inspirational restoration project um, that is possible. Uh, renovation of one polo field can create community space for many outdoor activities, including two to four international charitable polo events that can give the community, give back to the community 
fundraise for the Pogonif operational expenses and programming, share polo with the community and create an international tourist des destination. It'd be great to have a small polo museum created to honor the historic U.S. Women's Polo Association and today's female athletes who struggle with women's equity on this issue in the sport today. Without knowing it at the time, um, you know, these women of the 30s, invest, their investment in Pogonip and Pasatiempo polo grounds created the open spaces that the community enjoys today. This is an opportunity to preserve equestrian open space and heritage and in accordance with the Pogonip master plan usage that was laid out, which is as follows. Rehabilitate the historic clubhouse to serve as a staging area for educational programs, a meeting and retreat center special events. So um, we submitted uh, a letter for the council's consideration uh, to request that the amendments to the Pogonet master plan not be reviewed at this time in order to allow us more time to develop with the community and finalize our pro proposal for submission and review by the city council. Thank you. Thank you. I also have a phone number ending at 1810. Yeah, hi, Garrett. Um, as with many feel-good stories the council listens to when deciding to support various nonprofits, it's all about the story and not a financial accounting of the cost per benefit. It's up to the donors to demand accountability of the garden project, but you are one also considering this is a permanent home on public property. You are such a donor. I wonder what the total cost the city has expended in consultants planning, staff time, the true rental cost of the land being allocated in near perpetuity, the lost public access, divided by the number per year of homeless individuals actually raised to self-sufficiency, and the total community and not just elevated to government support like Section 8 is. I do like the percentage success suggested by HPGP, but what is the math? Similar to the budget, once the city approves expenditures, somehow accountability disappears and is routinely reapproved and shoved into the next year's budget without uh, much considering of performance. So that is a concern. What promises are being made? My understanding is HGP sells product in competition with uh, for-profit farms. Is that true? If so, it sounds pretty socialist considering the government's involvement. Do you have any answers to those questions? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and bring this back. I'm not seeing any other attendees. Uh, oh, I just see one more. Um, I've got call in use dash two. Press star six to unmute yourself, please. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, this is Douglas Deach. I am Executive Director of Pogona Foundation. Uh, uh, I very much support, oh, uh, uh, first day of the homeless garden on uh, Pelton Street. I was a party that supplied the uh, service there with Paul Lee and the number of people who were there. Uh, I very much support moving the homeless garden to their new location. Uh, what I wanted to do, though, was in, the, in this connection, bring to your attention the Poganip Creek. And uh, to my understanding, the Poganip Creek water has been sold somehow to some other party. Uh, uh, I'd be happy to talk with you about this. I don't think that's a legitimate sale. I think that came with the property, and no one else had any rights to that. It's a very significant amount of uh, water that I would like to see utilized for the homeless garden. Anyway, that's my support. And please uh, approve this and move the homeless garden further uh, forward on uh, Pogonip. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I will bring this back. Uh, there's no other public that's indicating they would like to speak. So I'll go ahead and bring this back to the council for further discussion. Deliberation. Any other questions for the staff? Um, see, Vice Mayor Bruner, I saw your hand pop up. It was pretty much a tie with Councilmember coming. So, <laughs> Councilmember, uh, Vice Mayor Bruner. You're muted. Thank you, Mayor Myers. Thank you, Kathy Kelso. Thank you, Tony Elliott. Um, this was a very interesting item to read through, and there were some many questions in there that um, were addressed, including in the sample 
uh, amendments that were provided in the in the packet, some of the changes, um, and looking through some of the graphics uh, that were provided. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Bonnie, if you can bring back that, bring up the motion that uh, for direction to staff. Great. Um, I'm happy to move this direction to staff uh, to initiate a, a process for relocation of the homeless garden project from the meadow to the upper meadow, um, including the associated public outreach analysis and studies and environmental review, um, and to direct staff to, to send this to place discussion of the proposed amendment on the September 13th Parks and Rec Commission agenda to get early feedback and confirm process and time for the amendment and to initiate the amendment process as expeditedly as possible and report to the council at its September 28th meeting on how this proposal would be incorporated into department work plans um, and to report back on the status to the council within three months. I have a motion uh, as shown up on the screen right now from Vice Mayor Bruner. Uh, I have Council Member, I'm sorry, Bonnie, did you have a uh, comment? I, I do, and I don't know if um, Director Elliott meant, um, addressed it or not, but if it goes to the Parks and Rec Commission on the 13th, um, the report for the 8th would be due three days later. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I don't know if that is a concern or doable. Thank you, Bonnie. Yeah, and Bonnie, I'm happy to respond to that. I, that's a really good question. I think, um, yeah, what we'd hope to do is take this to the commission on the 13th and then, um, again, their formal uh, feedback and vote on this. I think it just depends on what that feedback is, how quickly we can turn that around. Um, expecting to come back on September uh, 28th to the city council with a, a lot of detail in terms of process. That's something I think that we can start to think about internally and start to, to sort of conceptualize what that process might be. We can work with the planning uh, department on what that might look like. Um, but yeah, I think we can keep that date for now. It will just depend on what the nature of the commission meeting is on the 13th and what feedback they provide and what additional information we might wanna to put together for the council meeting on the 28th. But I think it's fair to, to keep for now um, and we can, we can go from here. Okay, uh, I have council member Cummings um, and then council. Councilmember Brown, Councilmember Watkins, and then um, Kathy Kelso has her hand up as well. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to second the motion. And um, I just wanted to express, you know, appreciation for the relationship that the Homeless Garden Project has had, the city of Santa Cruz, and the amazing benefits that they provide to our community. And, you know, just understanding that since 1998, you know, we've had this, um, you know, dedication with the Homeless Garden Project to move them into the Poganip um, that, you know, we got so close with the Lower Meadow and then, you know, we happened to find out that, uh, you know, there was uh, lead contamination in that area. You know, I think we really need to, it's in our best interest to try to work as best we can with the Homeless Garden Project since we've been committed to them for so long um, to, kind of, to find them a space. And it sounds like, you know, we found an area, part of which that was previously developed um, and so there's a lot of potential for us to be able to have less impacts on the environment by moving to uh, this proposed area. Um, and to, to the member of the public who called regarding the um, clubhouse and just parts of the clubhouse, you know, that's been sitting vacant for a pretty long time. And there's plenty of potential for being able to renovate that moving forward. This wouldn't stop that building from being renovated. And you know, if there's interest in turning that into an educational center, I think it would be great if we could start finding people in the community who might be willing to help donate 
renovate that building. But as it stands right now, um, the city doesn't have money for those kinds of renovations. So if we were to not move in this direction, that building would still sit vacant for who knows how long. And um, you know, given that we've made this commitment and we in our um, 1998 master plan where we've said that you know this is a key component and it's an essential program, I think it makes the most sense to move forward um, at this point in time. So. I'm happy to second the motion and, and support this direction. Okay, we have a motion um, and a second. And um, I see uh, Council Member Brown, Council Member Golder. Um, Kathy, did you have a question or a comment? I'll, uh, if you have, we're in the middle of deliberation now, so we're starting to get into a little bit outside, but happy to, if you have additional information you wanted to add, please get it. <laughs> By the way, Kathy. You got to turn turn your speaker on. There you go. I briefly wanted to just comment on the question about the timing. Um, to have a fully transparent process, I think we need the timeline, which is part of the motion, and then hopefully the Parks Commission meeting will be mostly about what that process is going to look at because it'll have to come back to them as I understand it once there's an actual proposed amendment which they discuss and then they have all the facts behind. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, I've got uh, Council Member Boulder. So I just wanted to add some additional community benefits that the Homeless Garden Project provides that weren't brought up initially, and and um, and maybe it was a little bit. It was like I want to acknowledge the, the the with the cost structure of their CSA, where they provide um, you know the full CSA. They have the you pick option, and then they also do donate a large portion of those boxes to um, low-income residents in our community, and then they also provide. Um, we've had, uh, field trip opportunities and things like that. So they provide education collaboration with um, Santa Cruz City Schools in the past. There are also added benefits. And so in in, in a way that we can support um, them with moving forward with this public process, I think that I'm in total support at this time as well. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you, Council Member. I have Council Member Brown. Thank you. Uh um, as much as I would like to just hold forth about all of the wonderful things <laughs> that the Homeless Garden Project does um, and, you know, what it means to our community, um, you know, I I'll just say, you know, there, there are so many reasons to support um, the Homeless Garden Project and, and try to find a way to, to make this work. I'm um, really pleased to see that um, we may have an alternative here, and I think it is in uh, the city's interest his interest to pursue that. Um, so I'll, I'll happily support this motion. Um, and, you know, and just say there, you know, one thing I will say is that we've had um, some, some folks write in and I've had some, some people call with uh, specific concerns and have asked that we uh, or other council members um, include those specifics on recommendations for consideration <laughs> in this um, motion today, and I just want to say that the reason I'm not um, uh, going that route or asking for uh, for additional um, considerations or, or, or details in the in the motion is that I really see this as the beginning of that process, and I think that um, that folks will have an opportunity to share their their thoughts, their concerns. Um, I am quite convinced that the Homeless Garden Project will. Uh, see this through to the end at the you know the level of review that is um, needed. That's very important for us to uh, make these kinds of decisions. And I just have so much respect and you know enthusiasm for the work that um, you all do. That you know I see this as a really really wonderful opportunity for some community engagement and also um, you know uh, some additional uh, education within our community and activating that space in a way that I think is just going to benefit everybody. Um, you know in and, and so I just I just wanted to say um, you know thank you and and the, the folks who are concerned you're going to have an opportunity to talk about what that looks like and you know what ways we might be able to um, you know mitigate what you know the the potential um, challenges of, of using this space so I'm thrilled to support it and I'll, I'll just leave it there um, and um, thank you Kathy thank you Tony thank you Noah um, and everybody who's 
been involved in this long, long process um, since uh, for, for decades now. I just remember that site so on Pelton. Um, at working there, it, you know, as a, as a student, it like enriched my life. I know it has enriched so many people's lives, and it will continue to do that um, in its permanent home. Thank you, Council Member. Okay, uh, I don't have any other raised hands. I'll just um, chime in too. I think this is a really good. Um, I've, I've seen lots of uh, places that um, open space and organic farms work wonderfully to, together. And so I really have a lot of trust that um, homeless garden projects will not only, um, you know, improve and be able to expand their program, but actually I think that they will become a, an amazing steward on that property. And that property has long needed a steward um, and people who are there visiting. And Kathy, I was really struck by the amount of volunteers you have who come to the garden and that's just more people coming to our open space and using our parks. So I think this is um, really an amazing opportunity. So um, we look forward to working, working through this with you guys. And with that, I will, um, Bonnie, go ahead. We have a motion on the table by Vice Mayor Bruner uh, seconded by Council Cummings. And uh, Bonnie, can you do a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Alantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Holder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Meyer? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. And uh, Kathy, thank you for the thorough, um, uh, really, really thorough presentation today. It really helped us understand kind of how far you've come and why this is such an important um, thing to, to really look at carefully. So thanks so much. Thank you so much from the bottom, bottom of all of our hearts. We really appreciate it. You bet. Okay, thanks so much. Bye. Okay. Okay, next item up is, um, Item number 31, and this is consider appointing an interim city manager. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We'll then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Uh, and I will turn this over to Lisa Murphy, our human resources director. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, thank you. Well, it's, it's bittersweet to be uh, leading this discussion and presenting this item. As you know, our city manager is retiring at the end of the month after 11 years as our city manager and 13 years as our assistant city manager. And you know that we have contracted with a recruitment firm to conduct a nationwide uh, search for our new city manager. Well, our, our recruitment is not yet completed and uh, we will experience a, a gap in time. City Council has directed me to uh, prepare this uh, report to uh, appoint an interim uh, city manager and that interim is our director of water, Rosemary Menard. And I'll just briefly uh, provide Ms. Menard's background. As you know, she uh, brings more than 40 years of experience in the public sector to this role. And before joining us in 2014, she worked as executive executive level uh, water utility roles throughout the uh, West. And she brings a wealth of uh, strategic management leadership experience to this position. And we are all very pleased with the council's uh, direction to appoint Ms. Menard. Uh, I am legally required to uh, also state the, um, the salary at which she will be starting. Uh, if you do uh, approve this interim appointment, it will be effective September 1st. The salary will be commensurate with the first step of the existing the city manager's salary range, which is $120.32 an hour. All of her other benefits will remain the same as it, it exists now. Uh, upon completion of this assignment, whether it's uh, voluntary or from either side, she will return to her position as the uh, water director. So we are very pleased again to be uh, making this recommendation. I am very proud to be the, to, um, I am proud to be able to present uh, our staff and presenting you this interim assignment for, for Rosemary 
as we look forward to her leadership to get us through this interim time. So with that, that concludes my uh, presentation on the interim assignment of Ms. Bernard for the city manager position. Thank you, Lisa. Are there questions or comments from the council at this time? Okay, I'll go ahead and, oh, I do have one. Council member Watkins. I don't have a question, but I just had a comment and I just wanted to echo uh, my appreciation and excitement to have Rosemary um, step up to fill this role and she's done an exceptional job in water and we're really lucky to have her um, in, on this interim assignment. So since you opened it up for comments, I comment. Thank you. Any other questions for, okay, great. I'm gonna go ahead and take this out to the public. This will be for item number 31. Uh, on our regular, on our general business um, agenda. If you are interested in commenting on, consider appointing a, an interim city manager, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And I am not seeing any hands go up. So I will take this back to the council and I would look for a motion. I'll also comment that um, I also am just pleased that Rosemary um, has uh, agreed to this appointment and um, she will just do an amazing job. And I think um, we will, and so we're very thankful that she's able to do this and willing to do this during this interim period during our search. I see council member Watkins and then council member Kalantari Johnson in that order. I'm happy to make the motion to approve the appointment of Rosemary Menard as our interim city manager. And I think also, I just wanna note that I believe that she's the first female city manager, even on an interim assignment for the city of Santa Cruz, which is very noteworthy and exciting in itself. So happy to move that and to note that as well. Council member Kalantari Johnson. Yeah, I'd like to second that. And also just wanna echo my colleagues' comments. Um, thank you so much for stepping in and supporting our city um, in this way right now. Welcome. Great. Rosemary, I don't know if you have anything to say, but we just certainly, um, we're gonna. How about be careful what you wish for? <laughs> <laughs> we, pro we promise to have shorter meetings. Um, how's that? I think that will work for everyone. <laughs> well, thank you, Rosemary, for stepping up and I'll go ahead and uh, uh, call for a roll call vote, please. Thank you. Council members Watkins. Hi. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Brunner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That uh, motion passes unanimously. Well, thank you, Rosemary. We, we look forward to working with you. And I with you, thank you. Next in our agenda this evening is our oral communications. And this is the time for members of the public who are streaming this meeting. If you want to comment during oral communication, now is the time to call in. They are on your screen. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. If you're interested, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. You will have two minutes to speak. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. We request that you clearly and slowly state your name before making your comments so that we can accurately capture, can actually capture, accurately capture it, your name in the meeting minutes. However, it is not required to state your name for the record. Please remember this is a time for council to hear from the public. We are not able to engage in dialogue with each member of the public, but when we are able, we will address the questions raised after oral communications has been completed. I see two um, hands in the audience, in the attendees tonight. Uh, first will be phone number ending in 0581. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for taking my call. <clears throat> um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, thank you. Um, so I uh, wanted to uh, ask a question regarding the uh, Santa Cruz Maniac uh, right out on the week at disruption and, and everything. Um, the uh, ordinance for uh, for a public event. 
event uh, for the Maniacs uh, event, it looks like to me, if I'm reading it correctly, would have cost them maybe in the neighborhood of like four or $5,000 uh, for the permit and uh, the penalty for not getting the permit is $110. Where's the motivation for these people to not do this again next year? And um, I'm not gonna state my name because I've been threatened by them folks before. Thank you for your comments. Next we yeah. have Lyra Filippini. Again, this is for items not on our agenda this evening. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, lovely. Uh, yes, this is Lyra Filippini. Um, today, I just wanted to thank the city, especially city council and the Historic Preservation Commission um, for approving and supporting the Amamutsun Tribal Band removal of El Camino Real Bells. This Saturday ceremony of removing the last bell in Santa Cruz is such an important mo moment for the indigenous community and step in the important direction toward recognition of the tragic history of both enslavement and genocide of the indigenous population in California, which I'm sure you guys are aware at this point was especially extreme in Santa Cruz in the mission and surrounding areas. As we move toward a more equitable society, it's imperative that this reality be collective awareness. This happened on the soil we now inhabit and though it began with Spanish colonialism, it continued and in some ways was actually escalated for the period after Alta California became part of the United States. I'm very proud of our city for being the first city to support this effort by the local Amamutsun Tribal Band. And I wanna give a special thanks to Mayor Donna Myers and member Justin Cummings for agreeing to speak at Saturday's event. Val Lopez, the chairperson of this tribal band expressed great gratitude for that gesture. And he said he hopes to see many city council and staff there on Saturday. I hope to see you too. Thanks. Thank you. Next, I have uh, call in user three. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good evening. Uh, this is Doug Deach calling again. Uh, well, first thing, uh, I, what I wanted to do, I didn't get a chance to call in, but I wanted to congratulate and wish the best to. Uh, City Manager Bernal and Chris Schneider uh, on their retirement. Uh, next, what I wanted to. Oh, lost you. You're, we need to. Uh, you need next, to. Uh, excuse me. Excuse me. You're, you're so I got through uh, Bernal and uh, Schneider. Uh, next, uh, I wanted to explain uh, for a moment about Poganip Foundation, which is a, a nonprofit 501c3 I founded in uh, 1995 for the purpose of uh, basically restoring the Poganip Clubhouse building, which uh, back to this, this year marks the 25th year, uh, 10 years before the lease that I'd been negotiating with the city was due to expire. And I would be handing the city to this year the uh, keys to a completely renovated national Register Pogan and Clubhouse building. Uh, I wanted to make the bring, bring that up. Uh, Poganip.org is a website that explains this. Uh, the last thing is uh, uh, I'm concerned. Well, the city of Santa, the city of San Diego just had a direct potable reuse project approved that they've been working on since 2014. Excuse me. I mentioned last time DougDeach.info. That is my direct potable reuse problem, the 21,000 acre Monterey Bay Estuary National Monument. Please check it out. That's all it's gonna work here with 3.5 feet of sea level rise projected by the commission in the next 30 years. Thank you very much. Have a nice Thank you. Next I have phone number ending in 1810. Although looks like he just disappeared. Okay. I've got uh, a hand raised with Krista Corwin. A star six, please. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so, hello, council members. Good evening. Um, I wanted to, I've been trying to find the answer to this question, so I thought I might as well just come and ask. Um, our council members, um, Mayor, Mayor Myers, Council Member Kalantari Johnson, and Kalantari, I'm sorry, and Council Member Golder, um, 
today currently under investigation by the FTPC. Um, I just wanted to ask and give you a chance to answer that. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is um, I appreciate that um, the uh, grand jury gave uh, the city council, um, you know, that there was uh, an obligation of the city council to um, respond to concerns of uh, fire, um, potential wildfire damage, and that was a, a large part of the impetus to um, crack down on encampments. Um, however, as I've expressed many times, and so have a lot of other people, uh, you know, that the TOLO or the CSSO, um, you know, did that in a really discriminatory way and, and probably not um, the way that we, you know, should have done so, given, um, you know, of our own Santa Cruz County citizens who um, are experiencing homelessness and just trying to survive out there. So with that, um, I do want to ask that uh, City Council um, agendize um, nullifying the CSSO um, and, of course, the only folks who would be able to participate in that discussion are folks who do not have a conflict of interest. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have phone number ending in 1810. Uh, Bonnie, this is anti-mandate, not anti-vax. Uh, the pressure of the profit and fear control agenda has hastily applied a safe and effective label to a vaccine with only six months of data, no view, which so far has killed over 6,000 citizens, including my dead personal friend, Jim, caused 37,000 serious injuries and 450,000 adverse effect reports that mount weekly. That information is highly censored out of the media. The truth is now expendable, but simple math says that mRNA vaccines are 20 times more lethal than a normal flu shot. Troubling our report totally vaccinated Israel, where the increase in incidence of heart attacks in young people fingers a vaccination cause. The theory is that vaccine generates spike proteins lodged in organs they shouldn't be, and the body attacks those organs and can make for micro blood cladding, all of which needs more forensic pathology investigation, but we get crickets. I would remind that damaged cells in the heart and brain reproduce much, they scar. COVID is not smallpox. Subjecting near zero risk children or childbearing age people to mRNA vax or requiring vaccine health pathology passports to work, eat, move about, and worse, wishing ill and dehumanizing those who believe differently in medical procedure informed consent to force these healthy and even no-risk young or recovered people to take these risks against their will by another's choosing is purely immoral. The effectiveness of vaccines is short-lived, requiring unknown more the vaccinated can still be infected, shed, transmit, making zero COVID immunity via these vaccines uncertain. This is what the beginning of what an evil authoritarianism looks like. Don't ask where the trains are going. The worst is the dehumanizing, isolation, identity, and educational dep deprivation of young children, all of them subject to unnecessary risk for no benefit. This is child predation. The co Trail. Dante said the deepest depth of hell is reserved for betrayal. Solomon Rusty wrote, children are the vessels into which adults pour their poison. Why were the early treatments to help sick people deprioritized? Why does even the mere mention of ivermectin in India get a media ban? Thank Answer, you. greed and power. Thank you. Next up, I have phone number 4558, please. Hi. So I've got a concern about trash. I'm just going to read this to you. There's trash everywhere. Highway 1, Highway 17, 280, 101, 84, on the trail to Three Mile, on the sand dunes at Scotts Creek, on the pullout to Waddell, on the pullout just past Bayhound Rock, on every single pullout. There's trash on Olive Springs Road, on Old San Jose Road, on Soquel, on Chanticleer. There's trash everywhere, and no one picks it up. Well, that's a lie. I pick it up when I surf, when I'm driving the one and can't stand it anymore, so I pull over and pick up trash cans full of trash when I'm walking down any street in town, and there's trash literally every 10 feet, and occasionally I see others doing the same. Nature is an extension of us. It creates us, sustains us. The food we eat comes from nature, and how do we give thanks? By trashing it. This is a real disconnection here and that collectively we no longer feel love and appreciation for nature, so much so to trash it and not pick it up. This is a collective failure and it needs to be addressed. 
So here's some solutions. Once a month, block Highway 1 from Swift Street to Onion Nuevo or anywhere. Post signs on East Cliff and West Cliff. Invite people to help clean. Local government helps. Anyone helps. Take kids out of school. Block the highway for two hours. Teach them the importance of cleaning up. I guarantee people will show up. This will rebuild a connection with nature and a feeling of respect, pride, appreciation, and beauty. There's a huge misconception that picking up trash is us, that it's somehow for the low-hanging fruit. Nothing could be further from the truth. Keeping our world clean is not a punishment, it's a responsibility and a privilege. It demonstrates appreciation for life, not wanting to dump trash on it, just like you wouldn't dump trash in your living room, and we're all responsible. Uh, yeah, the people in Mass have lost connection. Local officials have lost connection. Caltrans has lost connection. Nobody cares. The trash I'm picking up is decades old. We need to slow down and reprice what really matters in life and regain sanity. It's important for everyone. Without it, we are literally living in a dump, and it's just getting worse. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Yeah. I'm not... Okay, I've got one more for uh, oral communications. Heather, please press star six. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Um, I am a solo single parent that has a child in a local elementary school. Um, my child has been out of school since Monday. Um, with um, She had a, a sore throat in the very beginning of the day, but doesn't have it anymore. We're still out kind of waiting for this PCR test to come back, kid to go back to school, even though she's felt better for a while. Is there any way that we can help facilitate testing for students that need to get back to school? I know that um, we got tested at the Civic and the backlog for the results is taking, um, they said, between 48 and 72 hours. Um, it's just kind of creating this really um, I can difficulty for me because I can't get back to work and I, um, I don't know what to do. Um, so that's really all I have to say. I just wanted to let you know that there's probably a lot of other parents out there that are going through similar things and um, just trying to see if we can create any solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other attendees tonight that would like to speak to us during oral, oral communication? I'm not seeing any additional hands. Um, so we will, I'm sorry, um, Councilmember Golder, did you want to resp respond to one of those statements? I did, I was going to respond to two actually. One, I just wanted to say thanks to everybody that organized our beach cleanups because it really did bring an awareness to the community. And one of my little junior beach cleaner uppers, um, Kai Cora Nauenberg, went out with all of her friends on Sunday and went down and did a second beach cleanup. They even brought tickets and ordered their own pickers off the internet. And so it really just, you know, inspired them to take it to the next level. And um, the other thing I wanted to mention to the last caller was we do have tests at Santa Cruz City Schools at all the sites. And I myself have been testing kids um, every morning starting at 7.30 in the morning. And so I'd say contact your school. Um, I know when my son was symptomatic, uh, the, they requested for me to go to the Civic. And so that did take two days to get the results back and then he was able to go back to school. But um, if there's exposures and things like that, uh, we do have systems in place and the testing is free and it's the the quick 15 minute test and it's been really successful. So uh, reach out to your child's um, office. Thank you, council member. Uh, council member Watkins. I was just gonna add on to that because I do, um, I know that the testing is challenging for, for, for families and it's limited and it's delayed. So I don't know if at a future, maybe city manager update, we could hear about really what's going on and what the coordinated effort is in regards to testing. And this is not the first parent that I've heard from that is really impacted by a potential without knowing and then waiting, you know, for like a week before they can actually figure it out whether or not they can send their school, uh, their child back. Um, and I think some of it's just the delays. So I think even just how do we get the information out to the community if there is a potential opportunity for us to do that um, mm -hmm. at one of our meetings. Yeah, maybe we can look at our website as well to make sure that's all up to date. So, okay, great. We definitely will kind of uh, put that maybe as a city manager's update next next meeting. We'll have those those details available so folks can hear those. 
Yep, um, we can do that. I won't be here, but we can do that. <laughs> okay. Thank you, <laughs> um, Well, with that, uh, we're officially adjourned this evening. And Martine, um, congratulations on your final city council meeting. Um, you get to just go home and have Tuesdays to your family from here on out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, good night. Good night, everybody. Good night.